this talk is going to be mostly about oral and genetics web tools and database, which is something I've been working on formally since 2018, but really unofficially since about 2013. That was when I first got tested and first started fiddling with my raw DNA results and writing match algorithms and phasing algorithms and things like that. That wound up evolving into the current state of oral and genetics. Kind of divided this talk in six parts. First is not about the tools at all, and it's really about the core concepts of DNA inheritance that are sort of necessary to understand how the tools work and, and what the goals are and, and how DNA reconstruction works, generally speaking. Then I want to go into the reconstruction methodology that's used on the Borland Genetics site. And still, this is abstract, so we're not even getting into, into any tools yet. Then the, the core building block tools that, that correspond to the, the different steps in the re reconstruction methodology. And we'll get into the fun tools, I call them, which are the reconstruction scripts that make it easy. And these are the solutions to popular reconstruction problems, reconstructing your missing unavailable parent or visual phasing and things like that. Then we'll get into the creeper, which is sort of the flagship of oral genetics. I'll explain that later, but it's good to think of it as a, it's a virtual assistant, maybe something like Siri. And then get into some recent, the most recent upgrades to the site and what's new at oral genetics. It's definitely stuff that I don't think people have really seen before in any of my talks. And a little look into the future, what's coming up the pike. First, let's start out with relevant or prerequisite DNA inheritance topics. And I'm going to try to get a crash course in, in genetics. And you won't, not with everything you'd ever want to know about genetics, but at least with the, the basics of DNA inheritance, you can understand how DNA reconstruction works. I know uh, there's probably people of all different levels that are watching this. I'm sure for, for some of the more advanced people, some of this is going to be stuff you already know. But then on the other hand, for some of the people who are just getting started, some of the more complicated topics are probably going to be difficult. So I think there'll be a, a variety of level of difficulty and level of content here. The core concepts, I think there's really six of them that are that are necessary to understand DNA reconstruction. We'll go into each one separately, but to sum it up, you got two copies of each chromosome. You need to know what are, what's in your raw DNA file, what's actually being measured by the testing companies, what is phasing, what is DNA recombination, what's happening, and how is that useful for genetic genealogy. What is a centimorgan? We're going to go into that in a little more detail than just a unit of measurement. We're going to talk about what it actually means and how it affects our DNA reconstruction. And the concept of the different types of matching or non-matching regions that you can have between DNA kits for, for different donors. They're, they're called HIR, FIR, and NIR, and we'll get, we'll get into them. So the first one, this is a picture of the human karyotype, and this was from the National Human Genome Research Institute, and they have kindly made this free to share. This is a diagram of 23 chromosomes, and this is in a male donor. There's actually 46 chromosomes, that technically, because the 23 chromosomes each come in pairs. We each have one paternal and one maternal copy of, of each chromosome. And when I say copy, that's just what they call them. They, they're copies structurally, but they don't con contain the same information. One, one will contain genetic information that was passed from the father and one, one from the mother. And you see the first 22 are called autosomal chromosomes. And they're about, each one of those is a, a replica of the other, essentially, just carrying different information. And they're numbered from the, the largest to the smallest. The first 22 are the same size for each one. They're structurally identical, which is why they're called copies. However, the 23rd is the sex chromosome, and that is, in this chart, one is an X, the long one, and one is a Y, the shorter one. We're not going to get too much into chromosome 23 in this presentation because it's not too relevant to DNA reconstruction. The tools do reconstruct chromosome 23, and it's a little different than the others. If you understand the, the core concepts about autosomal recombination and stuff, you'll be fine uh, to understand the rest of the talk. So the important thing to come out of this is we have a pair of copies for each chromosome. So there's two chromosome ones, one chromosome one you got from your father, one you got from your mother. And that's why I say we inherit half of our DNA from, from each parent. Next thing is what is in a raw DNA file? This is a, one of my ancestry kits. I believe it's my DNA. This is what happens when you open the raw DNA file from ancestry. You see, you got a header up there. It tells you warnings and some information. And then basically you have almost, you have like 700,000 rows of data and each, each row contains five elements. The RSID, chromosome number, position, and then two measurements. 
Contrary to popular belief, if you open up your raw DNA file, it will not explode. You may not be able to upload that file to other websites after you do that, unless you zip it or whatever. I think it's informative to see what is actually being measured by the testing companies. And it's not gobbledygook. It's actual information measurements about different points in your chromosomes. The RSID is, you can think of it as your security number, sort of, for, the, for a gene, for an SNP. I don't know how they were assigned, but it's just a unique identifier that describes a certain position, a certain uh, SNP along your chromosome. An SNP is, uh, for our purposes, it's a data point. But what it is, it's a, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is an area on your chromosome that's known to have multiple values because there have been uh, mutations to our DNA. Your DNA and my DNA aren't very useful for DNA matching at a lot of at most of the points because it's just the same in 99% in of the population. But these are SNPs that have a likelihood of having mutated and which we can measure differences so that we could do comparisons. The position is just where positionally along the chromosome it's located, that the measurement is being taken. And it's measured in base pairs from one of the tips. I call it the West tip. Position 8, 82,154 means it's 82,154 base pairs up the molecule from, from the starting point. Then what you have, they call them allele one and allele two. These are the actual measurements. These are the, the proteins, the nucleobases that are being measured by the testing company at the lab. There are two alleles for the same reason that we just discussed, because there are two copies of each chromosome. And wouldn't it be nice if like the first column was paternal and the second column was maternal, but it's not that way at all. It's kind of reported to us as soup in that on any given row with no rhyme or reason, the first one could be paternal or the second one could be paternal. We don't know. All we know is that one of the readings is the paternal value and the other is the maternal value. So the, the A, C, G, and P are not just computer gobbledygook that doesn't mean anything. They're actual measurements of these nucleobases, adenine, cysteine, guanine, and thymine. Also, it, depending on your testing company, you may see, in, and, and when you tested, you may see I's and B's in the, in the file, and that stands for insertions and deletions. You may see no calls, which are represented by either a zero or a dash, which means that for some reason, the chip wasn't able to get a reading at a certain position. And they are few and far between, and every matching algorithm that I'm aware of treats them as matching because you're just missing a data point. It's not like it's a non, not any evidence that it wouldn't have matched your match. So now the other half of that is what is not in a raw data file, and there is no information that identifies which the alleles is paternal and which is paternal. So that's something we've got to do as part of our DNA reconstruction workflow. Any reconstruction is going to start at the parents. If you can't even tell which parent your DNA came from, you're not going to be able to drill it back further than that. So that's a problem we're going to have to deal with. So there's no significance to which alleles and which column. On one row, you might have paternal in, in row one. In the next row, you might have it in row two and so forth. And it's just completely random as far as we're concerned. You can't rely on what order they're in, in the raw data file to any degree whatsoever. And once you figure out which one is which for one row, you can't rely on that to, to predict anything about the second row. What phasing does? Phasing is a, a solution to this problem. And if you look at the first column of data there, it says you, that's your, your DNA potentially on the beginning of one of your chromosomes. And that's how it's reported as sort of DNA soup in the file. But you've also tested your, your mom and your dad, and you can make some deductions based on their readings as to which allele you got from which. For example, on the first row here, you have A and T. Mom got T and T, and your dad got A and G. Those, those are their values there. Well, you know you got T from your mom because she didn't have anything else to pass you, right? So, and that leaves, you must have got the A from your dad. I, I put all the maternal in blue and the maternal in yellow here. And you can see on the second row, same thing, and C and G. Well, mom had G and T, so she must have given you the G because you didn't get the T, and that's she, she only had G and T. Dad had C and C, so he obviously gave you a C. So in the next, where I have you there in the unfazed, I have, I've shaded that as blue and so on. Now I want to go down to the last row, number nine. Number nine is, is kind of illustrative of it. You have A, T, and, and mom had T and A. From that, you can't mathematically tell from that piece of information alone, whether mom gave you T and A because she had both. But you see that dad had T 
and G. So you know, since you don't have a G, you must have gotten that T from your dad, which means you must have gotten the A from your mom. And this is the kind of inferences that a phasing algorithm makes. And it's also why testing both parents, if you want to phase, is better because two-parent two phasing is going to be able to resolve some SNPs where single-parent phasing is, is not going to be able to do that, like the situation of row number nine. But in some cases, you're not going to be able to resolve it at all. Let's say that you have an AT and your mom had A and T and your dad had A and T. Well, one of them gave you the A, one of them gave you a T, but there, there's no way of telling which gave you which. Sometimes where you have valid calls in your, in your input, and when you try to phase your data, you're still going to end up with no calls in the output. So phased is simply taking, that's the last column here, is simply just realigning those SNPs so that all the paternal are in one column and all the, all the maternal are in another. And in real life, I uh, know of any one or any software that actually creates a phased kit in this fashion where it just reshuffles the uh, data and into the two columns and organizes them. Typically what we do, uh, because there's, it, it leads to the further things we can do with the data, the output later is we create two separate files. We create a paternally phased file that, that would have all of the blue letters and we create a maternally phased file that would have only the, the yellow letters and it would have, instead of those five columns, we saw in an ancestry DNA raw data file, only have four because it would be missing the second measurement. It would only have the, the measurement that is relevant to who we are reconstructing, in this case, either the father or the mother. This is important because we, we discussed how there are two copies of each chromosome so that you will get equal amounts from each parent of your DNA. That is, you'll get an entire copy of each chromosome, one from each parent. So what goes on within that copy is defined by a process called recombination. It's during meiosis is what happens is DNA molecule breaks and it reattaches. And at 50% of the time, it re reattaches to the other copy of whatever parent DNA that was being passed down to the child. So basically, it switches streams is the way I like to think about it of, a, of grandparents. And that's an oversimplification of the process, I know, but I think it's sufficient to, for understanding of recombination does and how it affects genetic genealogy. In this diagram, I have put an oval around a sing each single person here. There's no oval around the bottom person, but I'll get into that in a minute. There are three generations in this chart. And I know it's hard to read, so, but I, I'm going to explain them, so I, I don't think we're going to need to squint. On the bottom row, we're looking at a child. We're looking at a child's paternal copy of his DNA. So that's why there's no oval there, because I didn't show his maternal copy. This We're not looking at the DNA. We're not looking at an entire chromosome. We're only looking at the paternal copy. And the reason I did that is simply because it's already small and you have to squint. I didn't want to make it twice as wide. So the next row, the, the middle row we're going up is, is the father. And it's a circle around it because those are the two copies of this chromosome that the father had. And at the top, we actually have two people's DNA here. We have each of the father's parents, the father's father with the yellow and red copies and the father's mother with the blue and green copy. I've color coded it so that at that level, you know, you're looking at one color per copy of the chromosome. We're just calling that the source of the DNA and we're not worrying about it beyond that as far as where this DNA came from, from, from their ancestors. Uh, we could, but that would just complicate this to the point where we don't want to do that. You'll see in bet between the top generation and with the grandparents and the, the middle generation of the father, for example, there was one recombination event that occurred. And we can only detect recombination events when they result in the switching of the streams. Because, I mean, there may have been other recombinations, but if the result was the re they recombine with the same stream, it's not detectable. It's, it's, it's seamless. We only refer to the, the recombination events that is, result in a change in the streams of DNA as an actual recombination for genealogy purposes. And I, I think that's probably the convention for biology generally. What happened here is we see there is between the yellow and red when the paternal grandfather was passing his DNA down to his son, down to the child's father. He, there was a recombination event that occurred between block one and block two, where he stopped passing yellow, we stopped passing paternal, and he started passing mater his maternal DNA to the child, the father. All of that would be paternal to the child, but the yellow and red indicates it's paternal or maternal to the, to the father. So in this case, there was one recombination. And what I call, and I think is kind of the standard, is a resulting block of DNA that, that happens from recombination in a single generation. I call that a block. On the dad's maternal side, you see something different here. When, when his mom was passing down the DNA, it recombined twice. The streams changed from green to blue and then back to, back to green. So this results in having three blocks on that 
chromosome on the maternal copy. Where these happen is kind of random. I'll discuss that in a minute, but it's sufficient to know for now that it happened in the middle. It doesn't result in an exact 50-50 of each of the grandparents' DNA. It's, it, you may have a chromosome that ha- doesn't have any recombinations. It's just all from one side relative to that parent. Then we see what happens in the next generation, and I call these segments, where each block You'll see what happened here is the top portion, there was only one recombination in that bottom generation, even though you've got four different colors, because between block one and two is where the recombination occurred in that generation, where it went from the green and blue. Dad went from passing his green and blue, his mother's copy, to passing on the yellow and red, his father's copy. And that's the recombination that happened in the most recent generation. I call them blocks. However, that resulted in four different segments. And I find a segment is as far back as need be. For a, a, It doesn't have to be in the most recent recombination, but it's a segment of DNA that came from a distinct ancestor. This is what a matching segment looks like now. Uh, These are two different people. The first one is the one we just looked at, the paternal copy of of that child. But that child has a first cousin here, descends from those four grandparents saying that cousin one has a different mother that wasn't on that picture and and cousin two has a different father that wasn't on there. So we're looking at the maternal copy of cousin two that's going to have DNA from all those same four ancestors. And she's actually, you see, she didn't get any green. And that's just the luck of the draw. That's just the way their recombinations work. The part of the segment that's matching is only the part that's the same color here. So only that blue sliver is the matching segment. And that is what's measured by say Ancestry or any of the testing companies when they tell you have a matching segment with someone that's 20 centimorgans long or something like that. That's what that means. Even in this case, All of the DNA that's shared on this chromosome, on this copy of the chromosome by these two cousins, comes from the same source. So it's not like the black parts there that indicate no match. It's not like that that DNA is irrelevant or anything. It's not inherited DNA from from the same people. Uh, However, it's not matching. And you could think of it as almost like, well, on those parts, you know, maybe I got one grandparent's ears while while somebody else got the other grandparent's ears. We all got something from each of the grandparents. And on the matching one is where we both got whatever trait. and, And this is oversimplifying, of course. But it's where they both got the same trait from the same ancestor. It's they match in the same place, share data from that from that same ancestor. And that's, as you can see here, even in the case of first cousin, it's only going to be a, a fraction of, of the chromosomes, even if they got all of the, the chromosome content from the same people. It, they might have gotten different, different parts from different people. This is just a, a chart that I made here to, just to show you in generally. This is a chart that shows the propensity, the likelihood of a recombination along a single chromosome. And I picked chromosome 12 because it's just a cool graph and I had a lot of data. And you can see from this, especially at the east tip there, there's a much higher chance of recombination near the tips. Now, how that gets into, comes into play is what a centimorgan is. Instead of, since it's not linear, it's not really appropriate to use just base pair position number when we're, when we're talking about lengths of our segments and things like that. Because what we care about is generally how old segments are and how closely people are re- related. So what matters is what we call statistical length, where we define a centimorgan as a one in a hundred, a, a span of chromosome across which there's a one in a hundred chance of a recombination event in a single generation. So based on this chart, you would say that a smaller positional, in terms of linear size uh, in, in actual base pairs, you're going to have a, for a small segment towards the tip, you might have a much higher centimorgan ranking or rating for that portion of chromosome. Whereas if you looked at, let's say you had uh, 30,000 base pairs, for example, you had 30,000 base pairs towards the tip of that, you might have, you are going to have a lot higher centimorgans that's going to be considered than 30,000 base pairs towards the middle of that, where there's almost no chance of recombination. If there's no split near the tip, you know, you're know you much more likely to say that's a closer relative. That's another way to think about it. Because if it survived, even though there was a really high chance every generation of there being recombination there, and, and you've got it intact, that deserves more centimorgans, you could say, because it's probably a close, closer relation. Because if it was a lot of generations back, it would have had a, a very high likelihood of having broken up. So that's how centimorgans come to play. And that's what a centimorgan is. It's just the amount of chromosome across which statistically, based on measurements like this, there's a one in a hundred chance of a break and recombining and changing streams like we saw in the the previous color-coded diagrams. And you'll see in the background here, I have an equation that I came up with, and that's just like a curve of best fit. I know a lot of sites that 
it's called a Mary map and it, and it defines how you calculate centimorgans on a testing site or on a, on a third party tool site. And I use a polynomial uh, equation to do it rather than a lookup chart. The lookup charts are more accurate because you could have a lot more data points and you're not trying to make a smooth curve. However, this is certainly a good enough method for making meaningful calculations and calculating positions on a chromosome. And the advantage of that is it's just super fast. It's really fast to make these calculations on the fly. And it's one of the things that allows me to, to make raw DNA tools, you know, on a low budget, because I can cut corners like that a little bit and, and save some money with the process. We're going to look at different types of matching regions, because up till now, we just said something can match or it can't. This is just a, a, a diagram from GEDmatch. And what it is here, I, I tell just by looking at it, full siblings because there are FIR, NIR, and HIR seg. That stands for fully identical regions, half identical regions, and non-identical regions. And this is where the siblings will match each other on one copy, meaning they have the same paternal information, say, but they received different information on the maternal side because mom passed her dad to one to one of the siblings and pass her, her mom's information to the other on that part. So that's when you end up with half identical. And those are the sections there that are blue on the bottom and yellow on the top. They're not split. I mean, there are some random points in there that look like they, well, they may either be full matching or they might be non-matching, but you could see very clearly that those segments of the blue on the bottom and the yellow on the top are matching segments. And GEDmatch indicates that with yellow, uh, with the blue and yellow scheme, that those are half matching. The green on top is where they are fully matching. It means where both parents pass the two siblings the same copy of, of their genetic information. And then towards the end there, you see some with black and some more sort of interference looking pattern up there. And that's where they just don't match at all. And that's where both parents, each of the parents passed each of the children the opposite of the copies of their data. So the point of this was not to learn the color scheme here, but although it's very important that you probably do if you use GEDmatch, it's to understand that there are these different types of regions and even on a single chromosome that's uh, shared between two siblings, because we're gonna treat each of them differently in, in phasing. In, in particular, we only use for siblings and I, uh, we only use HIR regions. There are reasons we don't use FIR, it, it has to do with the matching properties you'll you'll get as a result. And we can't use NIR because that won't, just won't, mathematically you can't resolve, if they're not matching, you can't resolve which, which copies they got from each parent. So we don't use that. All right, so just a quick review. These are the things we covered and hopefully you have at least a basic understanding now at this point. Two copies of each chromosome, one is paternal, one is maternal. What's in your raw DNA file? Long, long list of positional data that tells two measurements of different nucleobases, one from each parent at each line, and they're random. They're put in that file. Phasing explained, it sort of unweaves them. It makes those two columns of measurements, uh, one paternal, one maternal. Uh, how we phase, we got into a little example of that with comparing to a parent's DNA, but there are other ways to do it too, we'll get into later. How DNA recombines, and that is pretty randomly, and by definition of chromosome, if a chromosome is, say, 250 centimorgans long, then you could expect to find about, on average, two and a half combination events on that chromosome. It's actually more than that for, for a reason that's not obvious. Definition of centimorgan, and that's what we talked about, that it's just a one in a, it's a span of chromosome along which there's a one in a hundred chance of a recombination. HIR, FIR, and NIR are just fancy terms for matching on one side, matching on no side, matching on both sides. So that's your crash course in DNA reconstruction. And that's part one of this talk. Okay, so now let's talk about the actual method that I use and that the site use, uses for DNA reconstruction. It's an iterative four-step process because we keep on repeating four steps over and over again until we achieve achieved our goals. Step one is to phase. Phasing is like unzipping a jacket. You really can't do anything with the data when it's all jumbled like that in a raw, raw DNA file. If you can't even tell which is on which side of the family, if you can't separate one side from the other, even if you don't know which side it is, then you can't drill it back any further. You can't reconstruct ancestors with just DNA soup. You have to organize the data first by phasing it. So that's before DNA of a descendant it can be assigned to an ancestor. It must be isolated, unwoven from the haphazard ordering of the raw DNA file. Phasing can be accomplished at different levels. The traditional phasing, and this is like what GEDmatch calls phasing, the best form of phasing, I would say, is when you have an available parent and, and a child and you use their data just like we did in our example to mathematically determine what the data they share 
phase along the entire genome because you know you will match your parent along the entire genome because you got half your DNA, one copy of all your chromosomes from that parent. So you're gonna match everywhere. You're gonna unzip the entire jacket. And that's traditional phasing using a parent-child pair. And for that reason, it's the best kind. If you can do it, that's, that's what you wanna start off with. Uh, there's no need for the other types if you can do that. Uh, block level phasing is when you look at siblings uh, and you could un you unzip only their HIR regions because that's how, those are the places where you can mathematically tell which information was passed from which parent, which is still a lot of data. When you do this, sometimes you're going to get uh, kits that have the phased output may not just be all from one parent, but it'll have long blocks of, as opposed to random at each SNP. It's going to have long blocks of DNA from one parent long blocks of DNA from the other parent. And we could just realign those blocks. It's, it's, it's a trivial matter to do so. So you could phase using siblings in that manner. And I, I, I call that block level phasing. Your only obstacle there is to get around the fact that you're gonna have blocks of alternating data. So then the next one is at the segment level. The, the pioneering tool for this was the, the GEDmatch Lazarus tool. And it's an example of a familiar tool that a lot of DNA reconstruction people will regularly uh, employ. What it does is at, at the simplest level, it just finds the matching segments between relative and at any level of relation. And it, it puts that information into a file that represents the DNA of whatever the common ancestor of these people are. You're given two uh, sets to put your, your, your donors into. One might be descendants of an individual, your target that you're trying to reconstruct. And the other will be all cousins on, on the outside, I call it that are not descendants, but they are cousins or aunts and uncles of the, of the person that you're trying to reconstruct. And then the Lazarus tool does its magic. It finds all the segments shared for by the inside with the outside group and assembles those into a single DNA cat that represents your target ancestor. That's the really the three types of phasing as I, I would consider them. One thing about the Lazarus tool, and, I, and I'm not picking on the Lazarus tool because it does a certain thing and that's what it does and it does it well. It does a lot faster than mine, actually. The output is just a single stream of data, and it, it only processes and returns the shared output. In a sense, at Borland Genetics, we don't waste. We put to, because our focus is on DNA reconstruction. The entire site is based around that. What happens here is, you know, you're going to get one stream of data when you phase, and that's going to be who, who, the data that's shared by the two donors, right? When we compare two donors, then you're going to get information that donor A had. Uh, um, across those matching regions that, that is not shared. And that's from the other parent of donor A. Uh, so that's very useful information if you're trying to reconstruct the other parent of donor A. On the other stream of data, the third is the other information that's on the opposite copy of the chromosome that's not shared, that donor B has, but it's not shared DNA with donor A. So you know that's from the opposite parent of donor B. And in the classic example of the parent and child, we call the allele that the parent did not pass the child, if we're phasing parent-child, we call that the evil twin allele because it's like all the data that the, that the real child didn't get. It would be that child's evil opposite twin, if you want to call it that. On the other hand, the child's perspective, all the information that's on the opposite copy of the child's DNA that doesn't share with, say, the mother in this case, must be from that child's father. So, you know, from, we, I call that the dark side allele in part because the, my tools were created on, you know, released on Halloween and I had sort of Halloween for some of them in the sense of this is your father. There are three streams of DNA that result from the phasing process. And depending on what you're trying to do, each of those three streams can be very valuable and we use them for different things at Portland Genetics. That's all there is to phasing, really. I mean, it, unless you get into the mechanics of actually how to do it. Step two, then. So you've got this unzipped jacket now, or at least if you did it in block or segment phasing, you've got partially unzipped. Next thing is to do, now that you've got this DNA isolated into blocks of data that corresponds to single ancestors, is to map them according to which ancestors they come from. And we do that using, a lot of times, DNA Painter. That's the the main product for this that's on the market right now. And it's an, an amazing product because it's so versatile. You could use it for all kinds of purposes. You paint phased kits, unfazed kits. You could do all kinds of things. And the in interface is great. It's really easy to edit a segment, to change the name, to import your matches from any of the testing companies, things like that. Because that's ultimately how we're going to be determining which ancestors co uh, correspond to the different portions of these phased kits is we're going to be looking at their matching properties. We're going to be seeing who they match. In chromosome mapping, compare the genomes of donors of known relation 
for the purpose of, of assigning ancestral source to the matching segments that they share. For example, cousin one and cousin two, we know they share uh, same fifth great grandparent. And in, in theory, if they match on a segment, then it's probably going to be from because they both inherited that segment from the fifth that fifth great grandparent. And then when it goes far back. You got some population dynamics issues that come into play, and there's some randomness that you could be totally unrelated or related onto a different part of the tree. But generally speaking, if you're looking at known rel relations, close relatives that you actually know how you're related, the reason that you're sharing this data is more often than not going to be because you, you inherited this from your common ancestor. So we use that information to map the chromosomes. And a picture says a thousand words here. So this is an example of my chromosomes map by some of my ancestors. And you can see this has long streaks, you know, these segments that I inherited from each of my grandparents and great grandparents and so forth. This is very useful information because I mean, what we could now do if we have this information, we, we have the DNA isolated, we have a map of what DNA corresponds to which ancestors. And, and we did that using cousin matching. It's almost like the next thing we do is we just take a cookie cutter, do it and just slice up all the segments that are the same color and put them in a DNA kit and call that a reconstruction for, for our, our target ancestor, whichever one from the legend there. I'm not good with colors, but it looks like Max Rudenberg down there is yellow. Uh, and you just take all the yellow segments and you extract them out and you put them in their own file. And there you have it, a, a partial DNA reconstruction for Max Rudenberg. That was a DNA painter phase map. And you could do it that way. And there are reasons where that's very useful, but I like to step it back one generation at a time, because I find that you make less mistakes and you avoid coincidental matching. People who are related on two sides of the family that you can realize, and a segment doesn't belong where it does. So what I do on Borland Genetics is I have my own phase map. It's, it's a software within the database where you only assign phase to phased kit, and you only assign parental phase, only whether it's, in this color scheme, blue, paternal to the phased uh, whoever the donor or, or, or ancestor is, and pink if it's maternal to that person. So you, instead of having a million different colors that represent the different ancestors of, of DNA cor kit corresponds to, instead we have just two colors and we're just gonna drill back generation after generation. And that's why I say this is an iterative process because if you wanna be really careful during DNA reconstruction, I, I highly recommend going back one generation at a time and not doing it the, not all my cousins and cookie cut them and, and hope that we're not related in, in multiple ways method. I think this works a lot better. Anyway, chromosome map, phase map, kind of the same thing. I'd say a phase map is a special type of chromosome map that only looks back one generation and only it's only used for mapping phase kits because it's specifically for the purpose of making that mask or cookie cutter or whatever you want to call it, to, to put all the blues in one file and all the pinks in the other. But where we stand so far, as an example, you know, the mother mother child phasing example here, uh, we're going to use that again. First, we phase the mother and the child. And that was phase, that was step one. Step two then is map. Phasing, we, we created the three different possible streams. Whether we use them all, I mean, that's our prerogative, depending on what our goals are. Uh, we may not care about the child's other parent. We may not care about the grandparents of one, you know, on one side or whatever. So we've, we've resulted in three streams. We could map any one of these output kits for the purpose of reconstructing more uh, distant ancestors. So we can take any of those three streams, submit it to matching, see who matches on these 50% reconstructed kits and assign them to paternal or maternal to whoever they represent. And important understanding here that in the case where we're phasing a mother against the child, the in phase and the evil twin kits represent the mother's data because 50% of the, the data that the child inherited from the mother for the in phase kit, and it's the other 50% that she didn't pass saying that's the mother's DNA that the evil twin has. By convention, make it be, you know, the evil twin, a real person, put them in your tree or something, but I, I don't see any value in that because it, it could just as easily be attached to the mother. And it makes more sense when, we're, when we drill back further, because then when we're looking at pink and blue on our phase maps, we're talking about relative to the mother. And that's what we're drilling back by. And then the evil twin kit, you know, represents the kid's dad. So we could use that data if we want for the purpose of we can call that reconstruction a 50% reconstruction of the, the child's dad. If we really wanted to get clever, and we're going to do that later, we could take both the in-phase and the evil twin data and analyze them together and uh, get a more complete picture of what's going on with mom in terms of her paternal and maternal uh, copies of her chromosome. But what we've done so far is we phased, and at least in a hypothetical here, we've phased and we've mapped. Three is, 
extract. So we're just gonna organize all the, the information from the like sources from our ancestor, our target ancestor that we're trying to reconstruct. And we're gonna extract all that information into a single file that represents that ancestor. It's pretty simply put. Again, the cookie cutter analogy is a great one. So here are some cookies that we made and maybe from doing the process different times with different family members happened to have inherited some information about our target ancestor here. And you got some good cookies there. You got some nice ones that turned out great. You know, maybe those are the whole genome phasing where we got a lot of information, all the possible information. We got one there that's upside down. Maybe we're not going to use that to, for this ancestor. Maybe that's our dark side or our evil twin or something like that. So it may not be relevant to what we're doing here. And then we got, we got the good old one there on the top with the, the broken leg. And maybe that was some block phasing or something that we used to accomplish that. And we're just missing some pieces. But the pieces that we do have are val variable. I mean, you look at it, you, you see, see you, you got at least some part of the picture of what you're trying to reconstruct. That's our uh, cookie cutter analogy here. And what we're going to do next is step four, we're going to merge it. These output kits are what I call stackable, They're like building blocks. You could just merge them together. And there are different types of merges we'll get into later, but you can just stick them together and get a bigger, more clear picture of what inf genetic information your target ancestor had. Why do we merge? I mean, even if we, if we have even the best available resources, if we have a parent-child phasing, Still, the best you're going to get is 50% because the child only inherited shares 50% of the data with that parent. But imagine, let's say a missing parent scenario, for example, right? You're only going to get 50% of the missing parent tops using a parent and child because that child only inherited 50% of, of the, the father, say, and that's all the data that's there. We have a couple of scenarios, and this is where a merger really comes into play and why we care. The first scenario is what I call a simple workflow. And it's where we have multiple multiple siblings uh, that we're doing the missing parent uh, problem on. So let's say my brother and my mother also tested. So now I've got a different 50% that my brother inherited from the father than I did. So we look at our data and it, it, our fraternally phased data. In some places, it's going to match where dad ha passed us the same copy of his chromosome. Some places it's not. And it's going to be long blocks of, of data that match and long blocks that don't. So it would be nice if you could merge those together and create a more picture. Half of the places where, say, I inherited the my dad's paternal DNA, my brother also did. But half of them he didn't. So he's going to fill in half the missing data on my dad if we try to reconstruct them. In theory, we're going to get like 75% of my dad when we uh, in, in, in practice, we got 72%. So scenario two is what I call the complex workflow. And that's a situation where, say, you've got a, a, a common ancestor that you know a bunch of people have. You test like 10 of their descendants. And what you want to do is systematically go through each one, phase them, map them, mapping the portions, most importantly, that correspond to your target ancestor that you're trying to reconstruct. And what you end up with is, is you know, 10 DNA kits, synthetic kits that represent the parts that each of these 10 descendants uh, inherited of that ancestor, you know, a bunch of broken cookies. And the goal is to put them together into a more complete cookie. And that's why we need merge tools. And that's why step four is merging. So this is what inspired me to create Portland Genetics. I mean, it started out with a simple workflow that I had done in Excel. And that was for me and my brother and my mother's DNA and, and to reconstruct my father. The computer was steaming because Excel is not designed for these type of fan was constantly spinning and the computer was crashing, but it's not really designed for these types of calculations, but it, it worked. And it worked nicely. You know, we, we submitted it to GEDmatch and Sure enough, it's, you know, just like as, as if my dad had tested. So my cousin Richard, who's now also on the, on the board of Portland Genetics, he, he was like, oh, wow, that's great. You know, let's, let me just buy all DNA kits for like everybody in the family. And you could, you can create all of our ancestors this way. And I was like, okay. And I got to it for like a year and I came up with all kinds of stuff. You know, like I said, I, I made my own matching algorithms, my own Mary map, my own tools for reconstruction tools that, that were in Excel at first. And then I was like, okay, this will take a long, long, long time to process all this data in this fashion. So my brother is using Python for some computer programming, recommended it to me. So I watched a bunch of YouTube videos on how to, how to, how to program in Python and, and not in a vacuum. I, I had some programming experience before from college. So I knew what words to use. I just didn't know the syntax. The goal was, though, to solve this problem of analyzing all the data that, that my cousin Richard had assembled by paying for DNA kit for all the cousins on my dad's side of the family. And uh, the, the, the result was success. I mean, we were able to do this. Word got out a little bit, and, and I decided to make a commercial tool that, that others could use and started beta testing it as a desktop tool and then ultimately as a collaborative database tool. So review here, four-step process, phase, map, extract, merge. Those are the four steps. You may need to do it iteratively 
depending on the complexity of your workflow. And sometimes, you know, if you phase everything at first, you don't need to keep phasing it, it's already phased. So you may just need to phase, map, extract, merge, then, then map, then extract, then merge, then map, then extract, then merge, et cetera. There's some issues with merging that we'll discuss later. Some types of merges are lossless and some are not. So you may just want to phase, map, extract, map, extract, map, extract, merge, merge, merge at the end. So, for, so you don't lose as little data as possible. But, but basically, it's a, at its core, it's an iterative process. Working through your complex, your, your, your unique set of uh, DNA resources, depending on who you've tested, what companies they tested with, et cetera, and just going through, repeat, repeating this four-step process, and you'll get great results. Therefore, the core tools at Borland Genetics, we're going to actually start talking about the tools now. They accomplish these four things, and that's why I call them the four core tools. Theoretically, these four tools can do any possible DNA reconstruction workflow. You could use these four tools and be successful. I'm not going to recommend using only these four tools. There are a lot of easier tools. There are a lot of other methods and tricks and whatnot up, up our sleeves that we can use to, to do this more efficiently. But, you know, this is the full, what I call table setting. You got your spoon, your fork, your knife, and your cup. And with any, with these four tools, you can consume anything that they put on the table. Without one of them, you, you'd be missing some opportunity. The tools are called for phasing, the ultimate phaser. It's a free tool on our site. For mapping, HIR Mapper. And that's a subscription tool, but you can get around it by, you know, our, our site's fully compatible with DNA Painter. So if you use DNA Painter instead, it's free. You might have to subscribe to DNA Painter, but on how many phase maps and whatnot you're trying to create. But the, the on-site uh, mapping tool is called the HIR Mapper. Why? Because we only care about where donors have HIR regions with each other because those are the parts that are useful for, for reconstruction. And then extract, the, the extract segments tool, uh, aptly named. Uh, that's the cookie cutter in our in our suite of tools. And it's a manual cookie cutter. Then we have the, the Humpty Dumpty. We use to put the pieces back together again. That's uh, our merger tool. And that's a free tool also, just like the extract segments. So you can do all this stuff for free on the site. Ha using the HIR mapper, which is a subscription tool, makes life immensely easier for reasons we'll show later. And in real life, I use both because there is something about the simplicity of using DNA Painter uh, interface also. And I, I use my tools and I use DNA Painter in, in almost every workflow um, because it's just easier to do that way. But before we can use the tools, we need to know our way around the site a bit. So first, I'm going to show you where to find these tools on the site. The, go back to the very basics here. Well, this is what you see when you first go to BorlandGenetics.com and you see on the top, you can log into assist an existing account or you can create an account. When you create an account, which is what you're going to do the first time that you use the site, uh, it's just going to ask you for some information. You know, you're know, you going to have to create a password and, and things like that, just like you would on a normal site. Eventually, we're going to have like two-factor verification and stuff here. And so the reason that we're asking for your email is so that we can be sure it's you when you sign in. Uh, we have ways of marketing, and that's our Facebook group, and that's our YouTube channel and things like that, our Instagram. Uh, when we want to get a message out about a new product or something, that is not what we use your email for. We do not send spam emails. You will only get an email that says like someone has changed your password and hopefully it's you. Or you'll get an email that you're not going to get emails that say you have a new match that, you know, the six Santa Morgan match that was probably from the last ice age. You're not going to get emails like that that are just meant to lure you back to the site. Uh, and you're not going to get any sort of sales emails. The only emails you'll get by giving us, us this information are those relevant to your account. You know, God forbid someday there's a breach or something like that. This is the email we're going to use to send you notification. Or something. We haven't had that happen, uh, thankfully. You know, this is where we're going to give you information, where, you know, when you've updated your password or something, you know, the link to click to prove that it's you and things like that. Got beyond that. And, and this is, you know, no different than creating an account at pretty much every other website in the world. So I, of course, have an existing account. So, and after the first time you use the site, you will too. So that's what you do there. The screen is going to look like this when you click in to log into an existing account. Simple as it gets. You type in your password and, and your email that you use to register with the site. I like to let the browser store that. I think that's more secure um, because when you're not typing in these numbers or your password or whatever, you're not vulnerable to any kind of, you know, hackers that are tracking your keystrokes or anything like that. So anyway, now we're in. Um, you know, there's some steps between that when you when you first sign up, you know, it'll send you a verification email, you need to val verify your email and show that you're not a robot, basically. So at the top, this is this is the first, this is the home screen when you log in. So on the, when you're on the other side, you've entered your password, the first thing you see up there is the user dashboard, and this is going to be different depending on where you are in, in the game, whether you're a subscriber, whether you're a free member 
whether you have any kits uploaded yet, whether your kits are processing, you know, what's going to appear in that blue and yellow section is going to be specific to, you know, things that are important to you. So if these are things that are important to me, there's always going to be an option to upload a kit there because that's always important. The more kits we have, the more valuable is. That's just the way these types of databases work. You know, the more the more matches you have in the database, you know, the more the, the more valuable this is to you. The more you could do with it. Then we scroll down here and well, uh, first, how to upload a new resource. This is what happens if you click that button. You get to fill out a form. It's pretty basic. You can add a picture. You can add some information about your whoever's DNA it is. Uh, you, have, you have to promise that you have permission to upload it or that it's your DNA or whatever. But anyway, it's just basically filling out a form. Not a lot of red tape here. Just have to answer a few questions. You answer a question about the source of the DNA too. And most of that's for statistical purposes. If you make a mistake and uh, it's not going to like impact matching or anything like that, your, your kid's still going to function fine. You just might not be able to keep track of it for booking, you know, for bookkeeping purposes. If you test it with two companies and you mix them up by accident, you know, it's easy to upload. You just fill out the form. You, we take unzipped raw DNA files. So on that homepage, this is really where everything, everything happens here. And the resource manager and project, project widgets, the very first widget here, the resource manager. And that's a picture from the Smithsonian Museum that I took. But anyway, you click on that and that's where all of your DNA resources are. It's also where all your family tree resources are if you decide to use the site for creating a family tree, which we're not going to get into today. Um, we're just going to talk about the DNA side of the site. But know that it exists. You can build your tree on our site. So these are some of my DNA resources here. I chopped off the names on the top. Only two of them are living, so it probably wasn't too necessary. Everybody knows my mom anyway there. She comes to all the conventions. But anyway, these are the matches to my kit. And you say, well, why do I match myself? Because I have more than one kit in the system. So this is what a subscriber's match list looks like. Jen, that's just because I am a subscriber. <laughs> so that's what I have up here. For non-subscribers, it's basically the same information. It just doesn't have these nice collapsed, what I what I call cards, because they remind me of like baseball cards I used to collect when I was little. Uh, each of these, you see some stats, basic matching stats, uh, to your matches. And, and, and I like the, them organized this way. That's why I made this the sort of subscriber way of viewing things. So let's expand one of those matches. We'll look at the match to my brother. I was on a row further down. We didn't see him before. But anyway, of course, I matched my brother. So this is the information you get when you look at your match. And in this case, you see it says it's private. It's a private match, but this is my kid in my account. So it's private to the rest of the world, typically, but it's not private to me because I am. Anyway, it shows you some basic information. It's got an and topple, which shows you who his ancestors are. So if you match the person, you might have some idea how, why you match. And an uh, important piece of thing, information here is on the right, matching kits. And it's, if he has more than one kit that he matches me on, you can scroll down and look at each kit uh, individually. For now, what I want to look at is the chromosome browser. And I click the chromosome browser button on the matching kit information on that right scroll down to get here. So you can see just like on GEDmatch, you can easily see from the diagram on the bottom left here that, that I have the the NIR regions is black. I have the light green as the HIR, the half identical, and the dark green I use for the full identical. And I'm, like like I said, colorblind, so I picked these colors specifically because they're easy for me to see. Uh, so they're not the prettiest colors in the world. Uh, they're, they're not as nice as the colors GEDmatch uses, but they are very clear, and I don't make mistakes when I'm using them. So we got some tabulations there. You can see it, it shows on the, on the same screen how much HIR, how much FIR, what the total shared CM is. And there's also a draft drop down on the data by region under data by region where you could decide to look at the information graphically or textually you know these pop up the changes pop up in like a split second because this is already calculated while the sites while the page is loading what we wanted to get to and the reason we're even looking at the screen is is the phasing stage i want to phase myself against my brother here so i'm going to scroll down to the bottom of the page and see what is the chromosome browser toolbox and there's a lot of other irrelevant information at the bottom of the page so i just took a little snapshot of that part of the page that i want you to look at so that's a free tool there in the chromosome browser toolbox is the ultimate phaser. And you simply select which type of phasing you want, which, which of the three streams of data that you want as your output. Uh, and then you click continue. Note there's a subscription tool in here too. And this is kind of neat, but not necessarily related to phasing. It's the uh, profile to profile chromosome browser. So anyway, you pick your stream, you click continue, 
Next screen, it shows you what it's gonna, you know, what where these HIR segments are. It also tells you the phaser mode, you know, so you confirm that you're you're talking about A but not B. That's what you what I selected here on, on the previous screen, although you didn't see it. And it's detected that we're sibling. It's it's called it's the phaser is going to operate in what's called pseudo sibling method a workflow. And you really don't need to know what that means because the ultimate phaser always picks the correct one. It determines whether you're doing block segment or or whole genome phasing based on you know the matching properties between. Uh, scroll down to the bottom and you always pick option one. It's the default. You don't have to think about it. Leave it. Don't touch it. And then click continue. And then it says, it's just a, a confirmation that these are the settings that you want. Once you click that uh, continue button, it's done. So let's just recap that real quick. How to get there, the ultimate phaser. Select one of your DNA kits from the, from the resource manager. Click the view matches to find your matches. Find the matching kit against which we want to phase, and then click the chromosome browser on, on that kit. Now, if, if you're a subscriber, you actually have to take one extra step there. And you, like I did, you have to expand the match. Uh, if you're a non-subscriber, you're only going to have things in, in, in expanded view. You're not going to have that card view, so you don't have to expand the match. You just click the button. Scroll down to the bottom of the screen, and you'll find the ultimate phaser in the chromosome browser toolbox. To use the tool, it, it automatically detects which mode, so you don't need to do anything there. Uh, you select whether you want in phase, evil twin, or dark side data stream, and depending on who you're reconstructing. Uh, so you've got to you got to think about it a little bit because you know depending on what your goal is, you, it may be it may be different. Select option one every time. It, it binds the kit. It inserts static in the places where it can't reconstruct, and it does it based on those HIR regions that the match algorithm detected. So the only time, and and which is never, in my opinion, almost almost never, that you want to override that you want to click option two and have it unbound and then bind it yourself using your own phase map or your own matching algorithm is either if you are like a super experienced computer programmer that's made your own matching algorithm or if you are not liking the match data for some reason and you're looking on dead match and you're saying hmm these kits match in different places i don't think this is going to happen in real life you may have some minor differences based on the thresholds that you chose at dead match but you might like different thresholds than Borland Genetics chose, in which case you could bind it yourself if you really want to. I do not recommend it because I pick thresholds specifically to work best for DNA reconstruction. But it's there because I wanted to, you know, make this complete. But it's intentionally never checked by default and you shouldn't do it either. Then your output will magically appear in the resource manager uh, and it'll be linked to whatever the, you know, profile that you created for whose DNA this is going to represent. So that's the ultimate phaser tool. That's the, you know, that's the core phasing tool. Now the core mapping tool. Let's use the HIR to map a phase kit. And for this kit, I'm picking a totally different kit. I'm picking one of my dad's kits. And guys, so I'm going back to my my DNA resource manager and I'm going to look at these kits I have for my dad. I'm just going to map the first one because it's a nice mono kit. Remember, because you'd only map phase or mono kit. I call them mono kits because I'm a musician and I'm used to like doing a music production. So it sort of means there's only something coming out of one of your ears. So a mono kit is, is a phase kit in the sense that you're never going to have two copies of the chromosome in the same place in, in your kit. So it's like listening to music in mono. We're going to pick this kit. And at this time, instead of clicking view matches, we're going to click on exploring kit laboratory. And that's where all the fun kit tools are. At the top of the screen, you got this uh, video. I, I need to update that because I think it uh, was made back when the screen was laid out a little differently. Information's still correct. It's just some different things appear in different places nowadays. You, at the top, you have these kit actions. And this is where, you, if you wanted to do things, you could view your matches, download the kit, uh, transfer the kit to another user for some reason. So if you know your cousin, you, you, you have no intention of using Borland Genetics for yourself, and your cousin just wanted you to securely upload the data, and he wants to play with it, um, you, know, you can transfer that kit to him. Delete the kit, of course. This is your data. Um, of course, once someone's used your data to create a reconstruction, it's not like you can delete the reconstruction they made, so just be mindful of that. But uh, as far as your own data, you, you're free to delete that at any time. You're free to download it at any time. The ways users would, would use your data for reconstructions are very well thought out so that they're not able to use it unless they also have that DNA in their kit. So, for example, in the example of uh, sibling phasing, the, the, the option for B, B but not A would be phased out, would be shaded out in gray if the sibling was not a kit that you uploaded because you can't have access to what's on the opposite copy of that sibling's chromosome. Even so your own sibling, if you didn't have permission to upload that, that file, then you, know, you don't have access to the, the part that's not the same as what matches you. 
that's private information of the other donor. And we respect that, of course. So anyway, we scroll down the screen because the goal, the reason we came here in the first place was to see the HIR mapper tool. And that's where it is. It's down in the kit toolbox. Toolbox is a little funky, but we're going to work on the interface uh, at some point in the future. Right now, the extract segments comes up first because that's the first button on the chart. If you want to get to the HIR mapper, you got to click the HIR mapper button on the left side there under subscription tools. And that's what it looks like when you click that button. And you see there's a tutorial there that is actually very helpful, in my opinion, on how to use the HR mapper tool. You, so you could either watch the tutorial first or not, if you've used it before, and then click the, it says new HIR mapper utility, because there was an, a pre-existing HIR mapper tool that I had in, in the desktop version of the tools that did something a little different. And this is like version two. So once you click that button, you get to this screen here, which if you're familiar with GEDmatch at all, it shows you something similar to the, uh, the tier one segment search tool and that it shows your matches within the with Borland Gen Genetics database in order of where they match you in the chromosomes. And since we process information very differently here than, than GEDmatch does, tools like the Lazarus tool are like lightning fast at GEDmatch. Tools like their segment search are, are pretty slow. Tools that are equivalent of in-phase in allele phasing is really slow on Borland Genetics because of the way we have things organized here. The This segment search sort of tool the IRM mapper is just list of matches. This this comes up in like milliseconds. We use a different process, obviously. Uh, you're also on the screen. You can import matches from GEDmatch if you'd like to. Maybe someday I'll have it so you can import matches from other sites. Uh, the first time you use this, I mean, just use the information from the database. You're going to want to upload all your kits of your family members with their permission, of course. And that should be enough to get you some good reconstructions. We scroll down to the bottom of the screen. Moral of the story is we don't even look at any of that stuff. We just scroll down to the bottom and we click proceed to close relatives review. But if we wanted to access that data to cut and paste it somewhere, it's there and that's how you'd get to it. So that's sort of like a non-graphical chromosome map, whereas now we're going to do a close relatives review and it'll make a more traditional uh, chromosome map. So next screen, we see this and we got some instructions on the top and you're asked to look at your close matches, which we're going to display below and I'll show you in a minute. And you're going to assign one of five categories to them. One, it's paternal only. Your match is paternal only relative to whatever it is, uh, phase DNA you're looking at here. So this is a kit that represents my father. So I don't care if this is paternal relative to me. They all are. I care if my ma the match is going to be, because these are my dad's matches, if they're paternal to my father, if they're on my father's father's side, or if they're maternal to my father. That's the second category. Whether they're unknown which is, you know, just some random match from the database that you don't know who they are. Maybe it's a very distant match. It shouldn't be a very distant match because then it shouldn't be showing up, up on this list. But who knows? Somebody adopted something. Somebody you just don't know which side they are on. And then they're treated differently on the map. Whether they're related on both sides. I mean, people have double cousins. My Aunt Karen related to me on two different sides or related to some of my other families, on, on members on two sides of the family. I'm sure that's common in it's about everybody's family tree that, you know, you have some a couple people in one family marry a couple people in the other family because they live near each other or something like that. So you got to let them know if the, if the match, you know, is related on both sides of your family. The most common case of this, by the way, is the obvious one is that if it's the child. So me, I'm related to my dad on both sides of my dad's family because I'm related to his, his dad and his mom. They're both my grandparents. So you want to use that tag for descendants of the, the, the target of the, of the ancestor as well. I say ancestor, but I mean, whoever you're mapping. And then exclude. You could choose this if you wish to exclude a relative from the analysis for some reason or another. For example, if it's a, if it was a rough draft reconstruction kit that you did and you're not sure if you did it quite right and you just don't want to, you only want to use real data, right? You, then you could exclude that. I like to build on the ones I did and I'm just very careful that I try to do it systematically. Maybe you'd want to exclude a kit that you're not sure, even though you know what side you're related on, may have some endogamy at play and some of the segments may not be from that side, even though you're related to the match on that side. So you may want to exclude for whatever purposes, it just if you don't trust that match as being part of your analysis for whatever reason whatsoever, you're not sure how they're related. You think they might be related on both sides, but you're not sure. There may be endogamy that some segments that are related to you on a side of the family where you don't expect them to be. And that's what the selection looks like. I've picked a little section there where there's only dead people, so no privacy issues. You're just asked to fill out the columns, basically. It's a P, an M, a question mark, and you just do that. So whatever close matches you have in the database, scroll down all the way to the bottom. And I always save a copy to my phase map locker. I don't know why you wouldn't want to save your map. I probably should have put it on the next page. I probably should have just made it automatic and maybe I will in the future. Because uh, I, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to save your, your work. I guess unless you just only wanted to do this for the purpose of exporting it to DNA Painter. And then, you know, instead of you just download it and not save it. But you can do that. 
grouping mode. This is another one of those things where you never change it. Always keep group by segment. Group by block, on the other hand, is very useful. However, since this is a subscription tool, you're only going to ever click group by segment because the only time you're going to group by block is when you're doing automated visual phasing. And the very fact that it's automated means that the creeper is doing it for you. And we'll get into what the creeper is later. But the creeper is going to select the correct box. So you'll never have to consciously go out and, and, and change that setting unless you were doing something really, really advanced or just testing or something like that. It's there in case you need it, but you'll never need it because as a subscriber, you'll already have access to the creeper selecting the right one for you. So just leave it as group by segment if you're doing anything manually, because I guarantee you, you will not be doing manual visual phasing on this site. You, you'll want to do the automated version and why not if you're paying for it already. So this is what the next screen looks like. You know, and since I clicked that button, it says it was successfully saved my phase map locker. Um, I could also click the download there or I could view in the locker. And to download, you know, all I would just have to do is export it to DNA Painter if I wanted to, which I often do. I usually use the DNA Painter to look at the segment it didn't calculate and see if I want to make some manual adjustments because I might know the match even though it wasn't a close match, for example. I do that on the site too, but like I said, DNA is just an awesome tool. DNA Painter. Um, okay, well, anyway, we're going to take a look at the phase map block. This is the actual map that was just created a minute ago. Well, I mean, it was created last night because I, this is sort of like a cooking show where I've already, you know, baked the cake and this is another cake coming out of the oven. But this is the exact procedure. I mean, I, I made these screenshots while I was doing this last night. You'll see that they did a nice job there, right? I mean, you could really see the blocks of DNA that need to be extracted now, all the blue being Colonel Grandfather John Borland and all the pink being my maternal grandfather. Helena Frudenberg Borland. So now it's just a trivial matter of extraction to just take all the blue stuff and put them in one file and we'll have a reconstruction of my grandfather and take the, the pink stuff and put them all in another file and that'll be my grandma. And we're going to use the extract segments tool to get from that. And if you remember, let's review real quick. Select one of your DNA kits from the from the resource manager, click Exploring Kit Library. That's that little button that was on it. Scroll down to the bottom of the screen, find the HIR mapper tool in the kit toolbox. When you click the HIR Mapper button from the subscription tools section, in addition to seeing the button, you'll see a tutorial. If it's the first time, I strongly suggest watching the tutorial. It's very useful, but you don't have to. And, and just click the button and get started painting, assigning your phase, your parental phase to each of the matches to the kit and whatnot, and then until you got a nice map. Using the tool, again, this is, this is for recap. So on the first screen, you get a non-graphical mapping, something like the segment search uh, that you'd see on GEDmatch. Do not attempt to import GEDmatch data unless you have watched the tutorial. Tutorial, It is complicated. Using the, your Borland genetics matches, hopefully you've uploaded some kits there so you can have some good matches. A lot of them are gonna be your own kits because the, the database is still small. If you really need to, you could import your GEDmatch matches, but don't do it without watching the tutorial. It's not easy. There are some very specific steps. There are some settings, very specific settings you have to use on GEDmatch, whatnot. So. Watch the video if you're going to try that. Don't try it on your own first because then you're just going to send me an email saying it didn't work. Scroll down to the bottom of the screen. So you don't even need to do anything on that screen except for just say, oh, that's nice. That's my non-graph depiction of my matches. Just scroll all the way down to the bottom and click continue. Read the instructions at the top of the page just to review the instructions for sorting your matches into paternal, maternal, both exclude and unknown. Those are your five choices. Click the box to save the map of your Phase map locker, don't touch the other box. Always use segment level grouping. Click the button at the bottom of the page. It says proceed to your results, and then your new map will magically appear in your phase map locker from which you can view it, you can edit it, you could export it to edit it in DNA Painter, whatever you like. And now let's use the extract segments tool to create a kit that represents my grandmother. We're just going to do one of them for, for time's sake here. Not going to do both grandparents, but obviously in real life, unless for some reason you didn't like your grandfather or something, you're probably going to want to do both. Uh, why not? It, it only takes a few seconds. Extract segments utility, if you remember, was the default thing that popped up in that in the kit toolbox. So this time you don't have to click any of the green buttons on the left because you're already seeing the utility there in the box. What you can do is using a DNA painter map, or, or if you've, you've edited the Portland genetics map in DNA painter, and then you want to re-import it, you could do that via the choose file thing, or you could use the select a phase map drop down, which is what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to directly use a phase map that's already stored in my locker. I don't have to upload or download anything. Once you've done that, since it's from our site, it's not going to ask you to build coordinates. It created the map automatically pretty much for you. So it already knows what build it is. However, if you're uploading from DNA Painter, you're going to want to tell it it's build 37, unless you made this DNA map this years and years and years ago before the jet match merge or something like that and use old build 36. In recent times, just about every, every source of your data for a DNA map a painting is going to be build 37. 
you're looking at there, it says Helen, John, or MP Segments. Those are the three legend entries on the phase map. They were automatically created as such because I already have my family tree in, in this. Otherwise, you know, you would have to pull the news. DNA was a legend or on DNA painters, those are the groups are up here in the legend and you see all the groups from your, from your map that would show up down there. And you got to select which one corresponds to the ancestor you want to reconstruct. So for now, we're going to do Helen. You don't click both if you want to do both. You just have to go back and do it twice if you want to create John also. Then click extract the selected segment. On the next screen, it's going to ask you to create a profile for her. I like to add a picture because this is a, a deceased person that's going to show up in people's match lists. By default on our site, uh, individuals are public uh, profiles, almost like a find a grave type of profile, and whereas living individuals are going to be private uh, by default. Again, you can change either of those things if you don't like it that way. Just do all processing, and then that's on the kit uh, settings page too. On the, on the kit laboratory, you can easily change those kind of settings there. Privacy is in the top left put in some information, then you scroll down to the bottom. So the question at the top there was create or select donor, donor profile corresponding to Helen. And I already had this in the database because I had already done this type of demo before. So I just pulled up her profile. And like I said, she's in my family tree. So if you have it in the software's family tree, you just select her from the family tree in that drop down menu there. Or you can type in the information manually, upload the picture. You can have to do it the first time. So next screen, segment extraction successful. We want to go back to the home screen here. You could see now on that top on a user dashboard that it says kind of custom, depending on where you are and the, what stage of the game you're at. Now I've got this yellow box there that says status of kids processing, and I can track the, the processing of this kid. I can see right now it's not it's not processing yet. It's queued for processing. Then the next step, it'll be currently processing. And then generally, it will not appear in that thing that says kids that failed processing. That's a special place for the bad kids. That's where the, the kits that were like created that have like no data or something like that because they didn't match each other or something. It's hard to get into that category, but it happens sometimes. But uh, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, you will never have a kit in that kits that failed processing section. If you do, send me an email, we'll figure it out. Once it's done processing, it just appears in the resource manager. And here is, you know, her kit that's done processing. I'm going to move this over for a second because I can't see the right part of my screen. Okay, now I can. And look at that on the link DNA resources on the right there. It says type is mono, of course, because we only have the data from, from descendants of one of our kids, my dad. And the reconstruction coverage is 21%, which is the expectation value. If I knew where every single segment was assigned to, the expectation value would be like 25%, right? It would be the 25% of the DNA that I inherited from my grandmother, I mean, give or take. But that ain't bad. 21%, that, that's pretty good. And remember, we've got our merger tool, right? So if we did this with the part of my grandmother that my brother got, it's going to be different. And maybe we get 30%. You know, if we, if this was a great grandparent and we had 10 descendants, maybe we get 50, 60%. Who knows? Review of the extract segment. How to get there. Select one of your DNA kits from the resource manager. Click explore in segment in a kit laboratory. Scroll down to the bottom of the screen and you will find the kit toolbox. This is just like how we found uh, the, the previous tool, the HIR mapper. Using the tool, select the phase map from your locker or upload one from DNA Painter. Export it. If you're importing from DNA Painter, select build 37. Select the legend entry corresponding to your target, the target of your reconstruction. Click the extract segments button. On the next screen, you'll create a profile for who it is that you're trying to construct if there's not one already. If there is one already, just select it from the drop down menu if you've already got that in your family tree or if you've previously done a reconstruction of this ancestor. Click the button at the bottom of the screen and that says continue and it takes about maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds to process the data and your output kit will appear in the resource manager and you can look at all the matches after it's got done going through processing and matching. The last core tool and that's Humpty Dumpty and that's the merge tool. Again, we're going to go to my dad for this one just because he's got a lot of kits to merge so I can show you that he's a good example. To get to merger, the Humpty Dumpty tool, you don't explore the kit this time because we're not looking at a single kit. We're merging kits that correspond to this donor or, or this ancestor. So we're going to view edit the donor profile, which is the button on the bottom left under my dad's picture there. That's how we get to this screen. And this is not in the kit toolbox because it doesn't pertain to a single kit. This is a multi-kit operation. We scroll down to the bottom and we have our profile toolbox. I could have called it a donor toolbox, but not all these are real donors like my dad. His kits are all mathematically reconstructed, so I call them profiles. And that's what I call the, the people in the family trees on this too. So if you see profile, that means any person in your family tree, and you may or may not have a DNA kit matched to it. The, you click on Humpty Dumpty, which you see is one of the green buttons on the left there, and you'll see the Humpty Dumpty merge utility in the screen. You'll see there are three different types of merges. One is called the mono merge, 
One is the stereo merge and one is the, I call merge same. Here's what they are. Generally, a mono merge, it's used to merge kits that are within a single child clade with respect to the, the target. So if I'm reconstructing my dad, then I would only want to use the mono merge if the kits are only from, say, me going down. It's my children, me, whatever. I would not want to use a mono merge to mix data from my descendants and from my brother's descendants, for example, because we would expect to see that we have overlapping data that's not matching that we inherited from different parents of my, my father. So we would only select the mono merge where we expect a mono merge, but we want to do it in all those cases because the process is lossless. The stereo merge we use when we have data across two sibling plates or two, two child plates of the targeted donor. And, and we know we might get stereo output. So we want to do a stereo merge. And we only want to do that in that situation because remember mono merges are lossless. Stereo merges a, a certain element of loss. Uh, it's not a perfect process. The option three, Humpty Dumpty option three creates the equivalent of what it would be like a jet match super kit. It's used for merging factory kits for the same living donor to incorporate the SMPs tested by multiple testing companies and therefore not make greater reconstruction coverage of your output kits, but to increase the resolution of them, which is nice because they'll have less better matching pro properties. Phase kits generally have very good matching properties to begin with, but when you do that, I mean, it's, you're not going to get many false matches if, you have, if you've used super kits in this, in this process to, to top it off. Okay, so this is what the screen looks like. You see, I picked two. I, I have some duplicates in there because I've done this demo before. So I just picked two, one of my brothers and one of my clade. So these are both done from missing parent tools with my mother. So I expect them to overlap. So I selected the stereo merge and I just click continue. And that's it. And again, you know, the output's going to show up in the resource manager and they're going to show up attached to my dad's profile. Because if you notice on that, the kits are grouped by who, which profile that they correspond to in that resource manager. So things are really easy to find. All right, so these four core building block tools, you could perform any reconstruction workflow that you could imagine. That's what, this is, remember, this is the spoon, the fork, the knife, and the, and the glass. Anything you can consume, you can do with these tools, but there are easier ways to do that. So we've gone through the first three agenda items for my talk. And the first was to give a crash course in DNA inheritance so you understand what the DNA reconstruction process is and what tools are actually doing. The second, to go through the, the four-step iterative process that I call the Borland Genetics DNA Reconstruction Method. And that's just, you know, phase map, extract, and merge, the four steps. Then we talked about the core tools that accomplish each of these building block sort of functions that are of DNA reconstruction. So now let's take a dive into some of the more fun tools on the site, I would call them. These are popular reconstruction workflows where you don't have to think about those building block core tools because I've created scripts that do that for you. So each of these scripts under the hood has those four elements in some combination, but they are designed for more popular DNA reconstruction workflows. So you get to these phasing scripts, look at the top there, you see the different tabs there is a tools tab, and that's where all these phasing scripts are located. And what you see on that tab is a chart. First column has the name of the tool. Next column has a brief description. And the final column has a tutorial for the ones I've made tutorials of. We'll start off with the two parent phase, which I have not made a tutorial about, but I do have a nice illustration here made by Rolf Holt, who is one of the Facebook admins we have on our site. In, in the users group and on Facebook. This is the interface here. And what we're trying to accomplish here is phasing of a child using both parents. Why are we using even phasing if we have both parents? Because in order to complete the process, step one is to phase. You gotta unzip that jacket or else we can't drill it back any further. Why are we using two parents? Why not just use one if and result being the missing parent, right? Or the unavailable parent. Well, first of all, there, there is none unavailable. They're both available in this scenario. This, this tool only works with factory kits from the testing companies. Second, if you want to go back to, if you remember that slide where I had like nine SNPs on it and the bottom one, I got better data. I was able to resolve one of those SNPs that I wouldn't have been because I had both my mom's and my dad's alleles there to determine 
which was which that I inherited that would have otherwise have been ambiguous if I'd only had my mom's data. So going back to that theory, you're gonna get better resolution if you use both parents when you phase. It's not gonna be a ton better, but if you've got it, why not? You want the best possible quality you can get. So use a two parent phase if you have both parents. This is just that, that picture there that Rolf made and the nice illustrations. That is the interface. So basically you're just gonna select from your kits, which one is the child, which ones are the parents, and then you're gonna click continue and it's gonna do the rest for you. There's really nothing more to it. It's, it's a very easy to use interface in my opinion. So we'll go right to the next one. And this is one of the ones that did have a, did have a tutorial on the tools tab, but it's really simple. I mean, you probably don't need it. The tutorial I think goes into like ex extending the application of this tool and using multiple runs of it for different siblings and stuff, uh, which is useful information, but just to operate the tool, it doesn't really involve a tutorial. It's just a simple interface. You select, you know, the role of the, you select your first kit, select the role, whether it's the parent or the child, and then you select the second kit on the next screen with the almost identical interface. And then it's just going to pop out the a, a kit for the missing parent for you that'll appear in your DNA resources and your resource manager linked to that parent's profile. And that's why this section of the talk is going to go fast because they have similar interfaces and they're really easy to use. Next is the Phoenix and Dark Side phasing scripts. And those are two separate scripts. I have a tutorial about each of those. They're related though. Uh, they do the same thing. However, they just involve a different stream of data as output. So the Phoenix is going to be the in-phase output get that you get up from segment level phasing, whereas the dark side is going to be the output stream of the dark side alleles that you get from segment level phasing with your matches on the site. And here, uh, Ralph has shown us just some of the, the matches that, to kits that he's uploaded, and you select which ones, just like you would like in a Lazarus tool. This is very similar in concept, and the, the matching segments will be exported into a output kit and you tell it who that represents based on what side of the family these are on. If, if you pick only, for example, relatives that are on your paternal grandfather's side, you'll be doing a reconstruction of your paternal grandfather and you link it to that on the next screen. And, or you could use the, the dark side tool and use basically all of your paternal matches, for example, to create a reconstruction of your mother, because you're going to use the, uh, the data on the opposite copy of the chromosome, of your chromosome. So these are related tools. The interface is almost identical for them. It's just a different result. The, the, who you're reconstructing is different. Again, thanks to Rolf for providing those screenshots and doing the graphics there on those. Those are very nice. And I've been, I, I've gotten a lot of use out of those. This, this is also a reminder about the Facebook group. We have the, the Borland Genetics Users Group, and we have four admins in there, including myself. Uh, from around the world, and I picked Ralph, Jason, and Graham because I would consider them experts at using the tools, and they're extremely helpful and nice people, and they do a great job of volunteering to moderate the discussion in the group and, and getting people through their workflows, and a lot of times, there, there's people at all different levels in the Facebook group, and a lot of times, it's users helping users, if, and if nobody has the answer, then one of the admins comes in and answers, and if they don't have time to answer, then 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 I'll answer it. I check, I, I visit that very regularly and also answer questions on there if they go unanswered. The goal is that they don't go unanswered. Don't fear the creeper. This is the next section of the talk here. I told you that section was gonna be fast. We just went through some phasing scripts. What is the creeper? The creeper is what my tool that I designed to solve this mess of a problem that I showed earlier on. Remember, this is the complex workflow problem where I just have a seemingly random configuration of DNA resources that my cousin Richard bought for me. And the goal was to assemble them into ancestor kits representing the ancestors of all of them, if possible, just doing maximizing the amount of reconstruction possible. That's what the creeper does. The creeper is an automated assistant that is a workflow management tool. So it'll tell you what to do next in order to accomplish solving a problem like this. So you don't have to think about where do I go next? Which ones should I do first? Which tools should I use? The creeper also is educational is that when it makes its decisions, it for the most part tells you why and what it's doing. So you learn how to become something that you can re replace the creeper. 
you won't need the creeper. You can do it all yourself, even these complex problems. But I don't know why you would, because it makes life a lot easier if you have something telling you how to navigate a problem like that. These are things a creeper might say, because the creeper is like Siri or like whatever. It actually has a voice and talks to you. You click the button and it says things. It's almost like the uh, Zoltar machine from the movie Big, where you click it and it shows you the next message, your fortune or something like that. Except it's not your fortune. It's how to accomplish solving all of the reconstruction problems that are mathematically possible using your configuration of resources. So things it might say, I found your father. Can I help you reconstruct your mother? Right? So it, it'd be guiding you towards using the miss, missing parent tool or something like that. I see you've tested your child. Can I walk you through creating DNA kits for each of the parents using the Borland Genetics reverse phase workflow? We'll talk about that workflow later, but these are the kind of things that Creeper says. And then it's not just gonna tell you, okay, well, we'll use that tool. It's gonna walk you through every single step of using that tool from the process of phasing all the way to merging if necessary. So for mapping state, for example, in a workflow, it might say, Time for some fun with colors. Let's map the ancestor. Let's map the maternal evil twin. I see you're, you share quite a bit of, bit of DNA with Kevin Borland. Let's create a DNA kit for your common ancestor. These are the kind of things the Creeper says. How to get there, how to start a Creeper project. Because the Creeper is a tool within a project. You have to create the project first and then that will spawn the Creeper. And you do that at the bottom of, remember this is Tools tab, you go down to this, what is it, third from the bottom there and it says create a private project. It doesn't have a tutorial because there's a lot of different types of projects. You just click that, you go to the next screen and where it's gonna put your project, I probably should have shown creation of the project first, is it's going to put it at the bottom of, you know, below your other widgets on the home screen. So you're gonna see my creeper project and another reverse phase project. Those are private projects that I created myself for reconstruction workflows of my own family. And on the screen, you, you'll be asked to select what type of project and the type of project you're gonna pick for your first Creeper project is going to be a project of type Creeper. And that will put the Creeper into your project, into your empty project. And you'll just click on it and it'll tell you what to do next and what to do next and therefore and so on and uh, so forth. This is inside a Creeper project that I've created. So this, when you click on that, on that widget that corresponds to the project, this is what you see. I scroll down a little bit there so you can see the Creeper interface, which is just a picture of me with a microphone, even though it's not my voice. It's a very creepy voice. Again, these were uh, released around Halloween. And below that, you'll see some tasks that I had declined. And then you'll see some tasks that I had snoozed that maybe I want to do later. The declined ones are probably things I just didn't care about. Some ancestor I didn't want to reconstruct, maybe not my ancestor. And the snooze ones were just ones I wanted to do later. Maybe I was waiting for another DNA kit results to come and be processed by the testing company. And I wanted to wait till I had better data or something or whatever reason I felt like snoozing the test. Maybe I just didn't feel like doing it. When you click that button underneath the, the picture of me, then the creeper section there it says, click to begin, continue creeper session. Then what happens is the creeper talks to you. And since this is a PowerPoint slideshow, we don't have sound here. But in this time, it's saying, like I said before, time for some fun with colors. I found a kit linked to our project that requires chromosome mapping. Let's use the Borland Genetics HIR mapper to integrate a phase map that we will later use as a mask for segment extraction. And then on the right there, you see it's, it's created some, some choices for us. Yeah, let's map it. No, I already did this, in which case you can tell it which kits were the output kits because it apparently didn't identify them. Maybe you did it without the creeper or maybe you did it using the old oral and genetics desktop tools back in the day and, and you just need to link them. Uh, no, I don't want to do it. And that gets it onto the, the decline tasks list or no, not now, let's do this later. And that gets it onto the snooze tasks list to which you could always go and, and, and redo it later. Assuming that the creeper still thinks it's something worth doing and it's not redundant of, of another task it assigns later. So anyway, that's what the creeper interface looks like. It's really simple. It's almost like maybe a, uh, choose your own adventure type of story or something, or you just keep on clicking a bunch of buttons that Creeper tells you, gives you some choices to make and walks you through the complex workflow problem and just reconstructs everything that it can think of. Your first Creeper project should be what I call a generic Creeper project. And that's just by creating a project, there'll be a type list for what type of project. There'll be a drop down to create a new private project and you just select the one that says Creeper. That's what I call a, a generic Creeper project. 
depending on your resources, the generic creeper may spawn new creepers that have special skills. The special skills are reverse phasing, which is using in phase and an evil twin kit to, to create files for grandparents. And the second type is a visual phasing smart project, which sets out to automate visual phasing pretty much, although it's a little bit of a different process, it's, it's similar. So let's start out with reverse phasing. What is it? And this is the proverbial evil twin here. It's everything that you're not, which is good because between you and your evil twin, you have all of the data of one of your parents. So you can completely, in theory, you can completely phase, say, your mother's DNA using a child because you can unzip the entire jacket and you'll analyze and map and extract the segments and blocks from, the, from both the in phase and the evil twin. And the result will be as if you phased your, say, mother's DNA using one of her parents. You'll get both a paternal and a maternal file in the process. So this is phasing. A lot of genealogists don't have a living parent, so phasing is out of the question, but it's not. You just need to use a process of reverse phasing, and then the end, the end is sort of, well, I don't want to say trivial, but it kind of is, of just realigning the blocks into a paternal kit, into a maternal kit. The software does that for you based on your cousin match. That's the idea. So from the parent's point of view, your evil twin represents all the genetic information that he or she did not pass to you, your other half, your evil twin. When it comes to DNA reconstruction, the next best thing to testing a parent is testing a child. And we talked about this because it's the same thing, whether you test your parent or, or your child. Step one, that phasing process, it unzips the whole jacket and you have everything you need there to go to the next step and fully map, if you want, the genomes of, of both individuals. So when you test a child, you get two, chi you really, you get two children for the price of one. From a reconstruction perspective anyway, you get your child and you get your child's evil twin. It's called a pseudo sibling. That's uh, in, the, in the fancy terminology here, but we usually just call it a, an evil twin. But there are other types of pseudo siblings that we're probably not going to get in today, into today. But it's a category of pseudo siblings, which is a synthetic sibling that never existed, never walked the earth, but is extremely, extremely useful in DNA reconstruction. So, what we do is we look at the in phase child kit and the evil twin kit side by side, and it's going to tell a story, really. And again, a picture is worth a thousand words here. This is what it looks like. So this is in DNA Painter here. And what we're looking at is my cousin Richard, who I mentioned before, phased against his son Daniel. So that traditionally, when you do a DNA Painter map, most people put like the paternal copy on the top and the maternal on the bottom or vice versa. The, but we're doing something different here. We're putting the in-phase map on the top copy of each chromosome here and the evil twin on the bottom. And I, the easy, best way to put it, I guess, is everywhere, everywhere you zig, your evil twin zags. Wherever you inherited DNA from or Richard's dad, you know, the evil twin, the evil Daniel there, he, he inherited D DNA from Richard's mom and so on and so forth, you know. So you get this nice, I guess, checkered pattern here. It's just as easy as phasing, really, as long as you can tell which is which and you've got some close relatives in the system. All you do is assign which side is which, you know, which is red and which is green, which is Thomas and Sally, those are Richard's parents. And there you have it. You just need some software to realign the blocks and put all the greens and reds in, in, into their own kits. And you have phased output that represents the parents of Richard, not the parents of Daniel. So this takes it back a generation, which was our goal. That's reverse phasing in a nutshell. The creeper reverse phasing project looks something like this. It creates your walk through the process of creating profiles for the people that are involved in this part of your family. And this, in, this, in this one here, this is a different example. This is my mom's reverse, reverse phasing project. And you see, I've got a profile file there created for her father and for her mother. I'm sorry, Joseph and Margaret. And we're using me and my brother. This reverse phasing project is also sort of iterative so that if you have more than one parent-child pair, for the same parent, it'll do it twice and merge together and, and create a more complete picture for you. This is the phase map locker. I don't, I don't think I showed you before. I just said that your phase maps wind up here magically somehow. Every time that the creeper creates one and it automatically creates the, the phase maps in this, in this project. 
based on some input it needs from you, it needs you to assign some face to your closest relatives. And it does it in a nice, nicer, more elegant interface than it does on the HIR mapper because the creeper walks you through it. And you've got some cards and they turn pink and blue and all that kind of stuff. This is the phase map locker that's associated with the project. And you see they have interesting names here because I put manually reviewed on those top two because those that are, are ones that I exported to the DNA painter, made some changes if I wanted to, and then re-imported. The other ones below there are the segment expander enhanced comparison of in-phase and evil twin kits for Kevin Borland. Basically what it did is it calculated the recombination points. If it found a match in the system within one of those blocks, it assigned the entire block to the parental phase according, accordingly. So that you get that nice checkerboard pattern that completes as much as possible of the the genomes of the, the grandparents, we'll call them, because we already have a parent and child pair here. So these are the grandparents' reconstructions we're attempting. This is at the bottom, and this is after I completed the project. So we have our final output here, or one of them anyway. This is my mom's mother. This is my grandmother, Margaret. So the linked DNA resources all the way on the right. Sorry about that. You can see the reconstruction coverage is 41%. So we didn't get all 50%, but 41 is pretty good in my opinion. And remember, we can stack these together. So we could use my Aunt Barbara, for example, and do another type of project and add her a component using the Humpty Dumpty tool or the creeper will walk us through that. It'll probably create a different type of project or whatnot, but it'll spawn sub-projects that accomplish specific workflow goals. Now, the output of this kit you see is in this project, but it also exported it to any other relevant project. So if, if the creeper, the generic creeper project finds this output kit useful and wants to do something else with it, like reconstruct her parents, it'll export the results to that project as well. And they'll just magically appear in whatever relevant projects. So you, you, next time you go back to the Creeper project, even if you already finished all your tasks, you might have a new task in there now, and it might be mapping the resulting reconstructed file here into her parents, into Margaret's parents. The other type of smart project, because so far we've had the generic and we've had the reverse phase, is the visual phasing smart project. In this, the creeper walks you through the process of using the DNA of siblings and their children, if applicable, to create synthetic DNA kits representing four grandparents. Traditional visual phasing does sort of the same thing, except it doesn't create DNA kits. What you do is that you look at your match data and you make chromosome maps and determine where each of the siblings inherited their DNA from which of the four grandparents of the, of the, of the sibling. The goal for this is not so much the map as the kits themselves, because you could always create the map just by looking at your matches to the output kits. But the goal for Borland Genetics is to create these synthetic profiles for your ancestors and preserve their, their history, their genetic history, if you want to call it that. So it's a different process, and it's a slightly different output than you'd get from normal visual phasing, but it seeks to sort of solve the same problem, which is to resolve the grandparents' uh, information, what the siblings inherited from their four grandparents. So a visual phasing project automatically detects recombination points. That's actually the thing it's best at. Uh, it's not one size fits all, so you don't need to have only full siblings. Or, well, it'll, it'll, it'll analyze what resources you do have, It'll tell you which ones you need, and it'll often be the children of the siblings as well, because you could unzip more of that sibling by phasing it with a child than you can by phasing it against the other siblings. So why not do that first, and then you'll have more, uh, more output from your visual phasing project, project. And it'll walk you through that if you need to. It'll, it might even spawn a whole new reverse phasing project if you try to create one of these first. If you select a project of type visual phasing, I recommend you don't do that. I recommend you let the creeper tell you what type of projects to spawn because it'll do them in the right order. But you're free to do that, of course. If you're just interested in doing a visual phasing process, you could select a project of type visual phasing, but just be warned, the creeper might not have it. It might say, huh, you haven't done the reverse phasing yet. And it'll spawn one of those and tell you to come back when you've done that because it knows how to maximize the uh, output based on your resources and, and based on the matches in the system to some extent. So it takes advantage of situations where one or more of the siblings have children, like I just said. Unlike traditional visual phasing, uh, there's no need for three siblings in this. I'm not sure there really was to begin with in the other. It makes it a little easier. It makes it a lot easier if you have three siblings using the, the graphical method. 
But for this, two siblings is perfectly fine. The creeper doesn't care. It'll still find all the recombination points or almost all. It rarely misses a, a recombination point. And to the extent it does, it's usually an ins insignificant one because unlike the traditional visual phasing where we're just relying on what I call horizontal parity to say that something has changed and you know it's one of the siblings every time you get to a recombination point, the system is also pulling in matches on each of these blocks or segments. So it's going to get the correct phase. So if there were two recombination points in there that happened really close together and it didn't detect them because they were almost right at the same spot, it doesn't matter because it's looking at the cousin matches anyway on each segment and it'll get the phase right. Assuming there are cousin, cousin matches. Otherwise, it'll leave it blank and let you decide and there are some tricks it has to possibly resolve them using other methods. So the nice thing about this type of visual phasing is that minimal thinking is really involved. Creeper just walks you through every single step of the process. I guess that's also the bad thing about it because, you know, it's not maybe as educational as going through the manual process yourself and making your maps in DNA Painter and or in what or on the Stephen Fox spreadsheet and, and really learning about the recombination points in the process. But most of the people who are at the point where they're subscribing to Borland Genetics and that they're creating visual phasing smart projects have already done that. They've already done that method. And it's kind of cool to compare the results and see, see how they are the same or they differ. I think generally they'll, they'll be the same. In addition to reconstructing the grandparent kits, there is the VP reveal because some people just want to see the maps. And I think it's also a really cool way to display the output information because you can see what each sibling inherited from each grandparent on each chromosome. And I've come up with something at the last step of the workflow where it's called the VP reveal, the visual phasing reveal. And it shows you it in a more traditional format. Yeah, visual phasing project anatomy here. So this is these are sort of the steps that are done and not necessarily in this order and not necessarily every step. But these are the things that the creeper does in a visual phasing project. It'll do the phasing. That's the first step. If any of the siblings have children, it will inform you and create a reverse phasing project and you incorporate reverse phasing into the workflow to make sure those jackets are fully unzipped and you can get the most information possible about the grandparents. And then the siblings are phased and the, I guess these are a type of pseudo siblings, phased output files. They don't really represent any living sibling. I guess you could group them with one of the two siblings that you match when you do the phasing, but these are pseudo siblings in the sense that you've created DNA kits that represent DNA shared by two siblings on their HIR regions. And we're going to map those pseudo siblings. The creeper will behind the scenes, under the hood, it will use the segment expander and, and vertical parity algorithms to maximize reconstruction coverage. I already said a little bit about what the segment expander does in the reverse phase context, but basically it, it expands a match on a segment or on a block uh, to the entire segment or block as appropriate so that you don't end up with as many gaps in your reconstruction. Like on the Lazarus tool, for example, for what it's doing, you only can reconstruct where you have matches on gen match. These tools also reconstruct in the gaps. And you might say, well, what good is that? You're not having matches in there. You can't use your thing to filter. Well, for new matches, maybe it would be predictive power. And I would argue that there's just some intrinsic value in reconstructing as much as possible of your ancestor. It's preserving something much like taking a picture of them, perhaps not as personal or sentimental as a picture, but it's certainly your ancestor's genetic history. The creeper will perform parent level extractions first. So it'll create DNA kits for the parents. Then it will apply the dark side tool in certain situations. And this is where you have maybe the two sibling problem and one had a child and the other didn't. It could take advantage of that symmetry or lack of symmetry to use the dark side tool. For example, you already used the reverse phasing, right? On one sibling. And so you've already got kits now for that one sibling's father and mother. Well, why go through the whole process of sibling phasing with the other sibling then when you could just use the dark side tool? You could dark side the other sibling to the first output grandfather, I, I output father, and what are you gonna get? You're gonna get the output mother relative to you know the siblings, the portions that the other sister got and vice versa. So there's some clever things that, that, that are done within this tool that are kind of, only possible using raw data that's not a thing that you could easily do with mapping. I mean, you could, but it would take some software that just doesn't exist in, in our current technology. The creeper will then walk you through mapping each parent level kit and perform grant level, grant parent level extractions, which is the old goal of this exercise. Uh, and it's just the second iteration. Once you've got the parents done, then it's going to ask you to map them and then it's going to create them and then it's going to merge them. 
if necessary. And I, it's just about always necessary because you're always gonna have data from multiple siblings that need to be merged. It'll make sure it does the right types of merges. It'll do the mono merges first, their lossless, stereo merges last, et cetera. It does it in sort of batch process. So you'll guarantee, you, while I, there are some timeout issues, if you try to merge a bunch of kits right now manually, those issues are avoided if you use this type of tool because it will just batch process them. It knows how many it can handle at once. It moderates the workflow accordingly so that the system doesn't crash on you and you just come back later and it's done. And it might say, okay, we've done half the thing. Click again to do the second half, so, you know, the where we left off because it has a time limit just because it doesn't want people tying up the uh, server uh, forever if you've got this like 16 sibling project or something like that. I think the record is actually nine, but if you've got a 16 sibling project, contact me and we'll We'll, we'll do it, but, but I'll make some special accommodations. So, you know, the server doesn't grind to a, grind to a halt for, for a single operation for, that'll take hours. That's what it does. And then at the end, last step, it'll show you the VP reveal. And I guess I made this slide after this so that it's sort of like a reveal. That's the VP reveal, great VP reveal. And what it is, is for each sibling pair, and I've redacted out some personal information, some last names and some birth dates that we wouldn't want revealed here. And you just go through, there's a drop down there you see for sibling pair. So if there was more than two siblings, this one did, and this is just my mom and my aunt Barbara. But if there was, you'd have multiple choices in that drop down, and you could look at which sibling pair you want to examine. And this is not on the fly. So this was this was done by the creeper in a step before the page loaded. So this is going to be super fast to transfer between. Select chromosome. Here we're looking at chromosome one. You could just select a different chromosome from the box. And what you see in the first part there is your traditional phasing output, what I would call it. It's color coded, and I can't see these colors very well, I confess. It is my belief that there are four different colors there representing the four, the four grandparents of my mom and, and my aunt Barbara, which are, are my great grandparents. And what's nice is you can see in there that this comes up automatically, that little region chart of the chromosome showing the direct comparison of the two siblings. So you can really see like you would in like the, the Stephen Fox visual phasing spreadsheet, if you're familiar with that, you'd see the recombination points. Only here they're automatically de detected. There's no manual discovery of these points. And you can see what happens and, and that those colors change under sibling one and sibling two. The, the grandparent colors change at those de auto-detected recombination points. And you can examine them if you'd like. And, and you could make sure that there's nothing nothing funny going on here. You can make sure that when it says that they're HIR, that they really only are matching on one side and not on the other, and et cetera. And then it says they NIR, you better see four streams of grandparent there as opposed to as opposed to any redundancy, because otherwise it'd be HIR or, or FIR. So and there's also below that is the non-graphical representation of the same information in case you wanted to copy that onto a spreadsheet or something or make your own. DNA painter version of these maps or something like that. But that's the automated visual phasing in a nutshell. I don't want to call it auto automated visual phasing too much because there is an element, a large element of user input. So it's not like you just drop the siblings into a bucket and voila, out this comes. It's going to ask you questions about your close matches. It's going to walk you through chromosome mapping step by step, and it's going to do it for you basically, but it's going to ask you to take a look at certain things and confirm things. And it's going to have maybe a green section on a phase map. And it's going to say, this is a part where I couldn't tell where, what the phase was. Maybe you could tell from some of these more distant matches because it only makes decisions based on the closer matches because it really wants to be conservative and end up with accurate re reconstructions for these parents. It's much, much better to have less reconstruction coverage if the potential for the increased coverage is due to potentially junk data. So it always makes, it errors on the side of using good, good data when you use the, the creeper to run these tools. You can override that, but Hopefully, if you're overriding, it's because you have some personalized knowledge that, you know, the, that this map, match that it determined was distant is actually a match that, you know, how they're related. You want to use it to assign phase to a segment because you're confident that there's no endogamy involved or something like that. So it gives you the, the chance to do that. But for the most part, it does it itself. All the latest new features. This, we're, we're getting to the end of the presentation here. This is, this is the new stuff. And I keep track of this stuff on the ISOG wiki, actually. So if you go to the ISOG wiki page for Borland Genetics, you somehow get here through a bunch of clicks. But this is the, the new features section. So it, it has all the new features for every, I don't know what you call it, features release that we do. 
this is the the biggest one that we did spring, about a year ago, spring last year. So this has got some of the latest and greatest features here of Orland Genetics. And the first one there is the profile to profile chromosome browser, which I mentioned existed, but we didn't show it to you before, but now let's show it. To you. Okay, so we're looking at the bottom of the regular chromosome browser between me and my brother at the top left. And I'm comparing two kits. In this case, it's just our factory kits. So, but on the bottom right, you're gonna see a different thing. It's the profile to profile chromosome browser. And it's gonna take, since me and my brother have like multiple kits each, it's gonna, it's gonna show any segments that match any one of his kits to any one of my kits and juxtapose them there into one chromosome browser. And, it, and because it's doing that, it can't tell if it, they're, they're HIR or FIR, but it just shows you where you match. But siblings is not the best application for this tool anyway. The best application for this tool is when we go back, remember that slide with all the different gingerbread cookies. When you've got like seven parts of one ancestor and you're comparing it to five kits that comprise another ancestor that you've reconstructed that's maybe on the same side of the family. And you wanna see the overlap of all of those first category kits to all of those second category kits without having to sit and wait through a bunch of Humpty Dumpty merges. You just, this is just on the fly, calculates it uh, as long as the kits have already been processed. A big, big time saver. And you don't have to waste your time doing loss, you know, stereo merges that create loss in this circumstance because to get the information you wanted where these specific people, because they represent people, where they would have matched without having to do all the merges, without having to deal with any loss or anything like that. So very, very helpful tool. And it's one of the newer features here. And this is in the chromosome browser toolbox. Next one is the runs of homozygosity. That is a mouthful, a name for a tool there, but it's similar in concept to like the are, are your parents related tool on GEDmatch. And it's a different algorithm and it has a different output, but the concept is similar. It's gonna show you where on a stereo, on a factory kit, uh, the, the copies of the chromosomes contain identical data. So where your parental chromosome matches your, I mean, your paternal copy of your chromosome, uh, regions where it matches your maternal copy. And the implication there is there must be some common ancestor in the past that your parents had. So their parents are related to some extent. Here, this is my results. And it's not very interesting in my case because my mother has all Eastern European roots and my father all Western European and, and Jewish roots. So my parents are not related at the genetic distance closer than second cousin, because I could say that with confidence. Let's say they were related and I don't have an example of that because I don't, I don't think I have a factory kit where they are related. I, I've worked with other people in the Facebook group to test this tool and to calibrate it, but I don't have any in, in, of my own kits that I could do it on. But if it's found that they were related or if it had runs of homozygosity, meaning it found matching segments uh, between the two copies of the chromosomes, it would not only say that, it, it would show you the positions where, that were matching and it would make a prediction as to what range your parents were, are actually related based on what it finds. So you don't have to do this multiplying by four stuff and whatever, it actually is much more accurate than, than that. Also, one of the reasons it's more accurate is because it has a pretty good sense of when it's just due to endogamy. There are certain circumstances and different thresholds it, it uses on these matching segments if they exist, and it will predict whether it's an actual relation or whether it thinks the system thinks it's just due to endogamy and there's no actual close relationship. Rather, your parents are part of the same endogamous ethnic group that uh, is inheriting common segments because the, the members of this group uh, share a tapestry of of segments from uh, the founders of, of this endogamous population uh, due to a bottleneck or something like that, or due to isolation physically, geographically, whatever tends to cause endogamous populations socially. Next one is the global surname search. I've blocked out the living people's uh, information here, but you can search the database for people with a last name. You can also filter by last name among your matches. Hope this will be useful. And you can see that it has two extra columns that are interesting and they show you whether or not there are any linked children, whether or not there are any linked kits. So the linked children doesn't say anything about DNA. It just means whether or not this person has any children in the system uh, in the family tree that someone's added that to their family tree. So you know if 
you, you get, have more information about their family tree that could be helpful for, for you. Uh, and also it shows linked father and linked mother. If, if they're in there, you see some of those are blank because they haven't added those to their family tree. When you do a creeper reconstruction, the creeper also builds your family tree for you while it's going through the process. So for example, when you tell it, you know, a parent-child relation, well, actually it tells you, I found a parent-child in the system. And then it'll ask you to confirm it. And when you do, it automatically links them and makes that part of your family tree and remembers that the next time you go through creeper assisted work. So anyway, this is here. It's kind of fun to see who else tested with your surname. And you get some family tree information if they made family tree about it. You can click on the link and it'll take you to the profile, and, and which is very helpful here, uh, especially for deceased individuals, because when you click on that profile, you won't get an access denied or a, this is private. You'll actually get what appears to be something like a find a grave page that has some information about them, uh, genealogically, historically, the picture, things like that. Next one is uh, one of the most recent features is we've done some uh, family tree reports. And they're really simple ones here. That's almost for navigation purposes, because they're, each one has a link, a hyperlink, so you can go to that person's profile, maybe look at their kid if you want to work on reconstruction or drilling back further of a particular ancestor, because an anatophil chart shows you the ancestors of a, of a donor or of a profile. You could just immediately get to that person, start working on it. And there's also the descendant one, but more interesting than the descendant chart is the Leiaogram. And this is something that was conceived by Leah Larkin, who was a genetic genealogist, I'm sure many of you have heard of. And she said, well, why can't you track the, why don't we have a tool that tracks the uh, segments down generations? So uh, I think it took me about two weeks because I wish I had thought of that, but I didn't. So I named it after her. And this is precisely what it does. Um, what we're looking at here is a descendant chart showing embedded chromosome browsers in the descendant chart that show the segments of my great grandmother, Clara Zibon, that were inherited. So the top one there is my mom. And you see, I, the next one is me. I only inherited a subset of those segments of my great grandmother that my mother passed down to me. And the next one's my brother. And he inherited different. He inherited less, but he, it's a different subset of those segments. And then my mom's sister down there, it's kind of cut off. It's, it's a long vertical chart. So it's not very friendly for a PowerPoint presentation, but really you just get the idea here. And if there are additional siblings, those are horizontal and they'll be in a different color because the segments you're looking at, even if at the same location, because remember that the siblings could have inherited different grandparents data. So they're in different colors, but it tracks different sibling lines as well. And that's also related to why we do stereo versus mono merges. As long as they're the same color, then you know you're dealing with the same, a subset of the same possible mono total set of segments. Whereas if they're in different colors on a chart like this, you'd, if you're merging kits, you want to make sure you use the stereo merge because you don't want to potentially erase or replace data where you should be doubling it because you're coming up with a stereo output. Next one is the Y-DNA haplogroup predictor. I probably shouldn't have said predictor because that sort of implies that it's being like predicted from, from STRs or something. It's not. It's actually being measured from SNPs. And I, there's a very rudimentary tree that I put in here, and this is in cooperation with Meta Y DNA. And I used publicly available sources. So this is not through any Y testing results or, or some body of research that I've done or anything like this. And by public, I'm talking about like Wikipedia and also stuff on the ISOG wiki. There's a, there's a tree there and I've used some of that information to create the tree. And I've also used some information that was publicly shared but by FDDNA that, that appears on uh, public websites. And I've indicated some of that where practicable, but it's basically just from a, a wide source of public information from different sources. And let's see what the results look like for me. What's nice about this too, is you can do it from super kit. Whereas when you look at your uh, prediction from you know 23andMe or something, it's only using the 23andMe data, but you can combine it and you can actually get drilled down a little further because 23 and Ancestry tested different YSMPs too. And it looks like this, the results. So I'm EM81, and it shows you all of the positive upstream markers that got me to there that sort of, I don't know what you call it, reinforce the prediction. And it shows you some downstream, whether they're not going to be tested or whether I tested negative for a particular SNP state, whether it was a, a certain uh, nucleo base. So that's a kind of a cool tool. Uh, pretty soon, I'm going to have this automatically calculated for all of 
eligible kits and, and maybe have that as like a filter for searching among your matches too. But we'll see. The newest feature of all is the segment lab. And that is full integration of phase map editing within Borland Genetics. It doesn't replace the utility of DNA Painter, but it makes life a lot easier to have to go keep on going back and forth between the two sites for certain very specific tasks. So, you, so in this, the idea is that you use that phase map down there as like a teleporter and you teleport to a segment by clicking on it. And then it shows you some specific information about that segment. This is a chart that shows some of that information. So it shows that on the fly as this is generated here, the matches that are on that segment. And this we're looking at a phase map. It, it, this is based on an existing phase map. So this is editing a, a tool for phase maps that you've already created. This is not a phase map creation tool. That's what the HR, HIR mapper is. What we got here is it's looking at your map and then it's searching in the database for all kits in the database that match on that segment. And since I picked a reverse phasing map that was generated by the creeper, it's smart and it knows that. And it's also showing me all the matches on the evil twin that, that would overlap that segment. And the reason that's cool is because what, there's no data at the top and, and you know the, the in-phase kit just doesn't match anybody in the database. I mean, the database only has like 12,000 kits in it right now. It's not like GEDmatch where it has several million probably. If there happens to be a good solid match on the evil twin side, then you could use that to determine that it's the opposite phase on the in-phase side of your, of your phase map there. So that's really cool. And in this case, you see there is discrepancy. Then there's only three kits matching on the bottom, whereas there's a ton matching on, on the top copy here. It's good to have all that information on the screen that you don't have to leave the site for, and you could just assign phase accordingly or, or edit phase accordingly, because you, this is, a, again, to an existing mass. This is an excerpt from a recent blog post on that, by the way, and you could read more detail there if you want to. But this is what I scroll down below the match information, and this is the next thing on the screen here. Potential phase of the segment. Based on the matches to this segment listed above, you may modify. So it gives you the option to change it. So this is, I'm looking at an unknown segment here, which would have been black on the map. And if I want, I could change that. And this is relative to whose map this is, right? In this case, it's a woman named Penny. If you only wish to assign phase to part of the segment, you can trim the part. So it's got two boxes there for trim points. And this is something I stole the idea from, from the music production industry, because we use these, what's called the DAW, a digital audio workspace. And trimming segments of songs, of, of musical tracks is important you know, in, in music production. And you'll want to set the trim points, uh, the, the in, punch in, punch out points, maybe. So I got the concept from this totally ripped off from the music industry. It's really cool in the genealogy industry, too, because what happens on a segment where, where that was originally black, that didn't have any matches. Let's say you go back to the space map a year later, and there's a lot more people uploaded to the, the site now. Maybe you, maybe you created the space map when there were only 3,000 kits in the database, right? And now there's 12,000. You could trim it at, for example, where a match starts a new match and where a new match ends. If you only want to rely on the portion of your segment, your empty segment, which really may consist of multiple segments since you don't know because there's no matches on it, then you could switch, select the trim points to be the boundaries of whatever match you're determining the, the, the phase by. And if this is a reverse phase map, you probably won't need to do that because it's, you're almost undoing what the segment expander would do by expanding the map to the, the segment to the, to the block. But Anyway, you have that option to do that and you can take advantage of new matches and add them later to, to edit your, your phase map. This is a very low, low resolution image and I apologize for that, but it serves the purpose. I want you to look at the gaps here between like colors, okay? So let's look at the bottom one. You've got that little black gap between two long blue segments. Eyeballing it, you'd say, well, it's probably blue. There could have been two reconstruct, uh, recombination events that happened real close together, and it might have been pink inside there or for, for all of a portion of it, but just eyeballing, you'd say it's not very likely. Well, what about the one above it, where you have a long pink section and then a pretty long black section and another pink? Did that go back and forth? Was it pink, blue, pink, blue? Or, or is it just solid pink across that gap? So now I'm going to go back to the previous slide because... Using that uh, data that I came up with to make my polynomial Mary map that we talked about when we looked at chromosome 12 way back early in the presentation and using the definition of a centimorgan, 
I've created a tool here, a sub tool on the screen, which predicts the odds of having a double flip during that gap. So predicting that it actually changes from blue to pink to blue, as opposed to just continuously goes blue across a gap based on the length of that gap in centimorph. And you have some guidance on there for this. It says, you know, only re rely on a, a probability, a horizontal parity probability of greater than 95%. Otherwise, you don't want to jump to the conclusion that the gap color should be the same as the, the neighboring color. So this is for really good for assigning phase, for knowing when without using your eyeball, because you may not know about the contour of this particular chromosome, might have a weird spike in it or something, or what, what they call a hard break in, in GEDmatch. This sort of looks at that for you, makes that determination, tells you if it's more than 95% possible, whether the, the information sandwiched between two like phase uh, segments or blocks should be mapped to that uh, phase as well parental phase. So all this uh, increases reconstruction coverage of your ancestors, even when there's no matches. So that's nice, especially since this database is young and they're going to have a lot of black segments, empty segments in your, in your chart, unless you've just uploaded a, a ton of kits on your own, which I tend to do. What's up the pike? And I guess this is the final leg of our presentation here. Some stuff we're working on in the future. Some of it's interesting. Some of it's cool. Some of it's not. The generic creeper logic is going to be extended to use the Phoenix tool. Right now, that's where it stops. Anything beyond that uh, in your reconstructions, you got to do on your own. But there's going to be something called the phase matrix stage of the creeper, of the generic creeper workflow that's going to incorporate the Phoenix tool. It already does dark side and it already does extract segments, chromosome mapping, all that kind of stuff. It already spawns reverse phasing, visual phasing. The next step is to teach the creeper how to do uh, the Phoenix tool which is sort of Lazarus style phase, segment phasing of distant match. I'm gonna put more match filters, including the ability to search for matches on a specific chromosome. You can kind of do that already if you're a subscriber by going to the HIR mapper, that first screen with the non-graphical list of your matches, but there should be a way to filter it from the match screen and, and it's really easy to do. It's just gotta take some time to sit down and do it. Maybe haplogroup will be another filter and I intend to do that, but in order to do that, I gotta process the haplogroups of the existing kits in the system matches with recently uploaded kits, sort of like the new matches blue button on Ancestry.com, but maybe a little different, you know, have a, a time frame or something like that, as opposed to just ones you haven't looked at. But maybe I can make that another filter too. There's plenty of options for filters here. The only one that exists right now is surname in the tree. I'm going to have a sticky segments calculator. And yes, I know there's no such thing as a sticky segment. This refers to a blog post I did a couple of years back regarding the likelihood of a segment being passed down in its entirety or not at all versus being under the chopping block of, of a recombination event in a generation. And in that case, there, you know, as a, as a segment gets smaller and smaller, it's just less likely to be underneath the, the surgical knife of the, of the recombination event. It's just more likely to be inherited in, in full or not in full or not at all by the next generation. So this is gonna be a calculator that's gonna determine the age of a segment by looking at some calculations based on the definition of Cinemorgan. And if you wanna learn more about that, you can take a look at my old blog post. I think it's called, Help My Segments Are So Sticky. Then I wanna do a conversion of merger tools to a different programming language on the AWS, Amazon Web Services serverless. I wanna make them serverless so that they will be faster and so that they will not potentially clog up my server. And so that you could run multiple instances of at once, depending on the demand and depending on, you know, how many kits you're trying to merge at the same time. So that'll be a real time saver and you'll get your merges a lot faster once I do that. That's a big project actually, because it involves majorly redesigning the merger tool. I'll probably do a, a, a what do you call it, overhaul of the interface for the merge tools too. Then I want to do the, a stranger auto phase tool. I'm going to need a lot more data for that. So I can't do that right now. But once there's a lot more kits uploaded, hopefully maybe the creeper in one of its workflows, it can go through and just look at all of your matches. And this was an idea that, that Jason Porteous came up with, who was one of the admins in our group. And it just looks at all your matches. And regardless of which side of the family on it, it it'll just phase them, I guess, longest match for, first in, in any region. And so that it'll create not blocks like you'd have to reorganize like in block phasing, but it'll create an entire phased kit. It just won't, the output will need to be massively reorganized because segment by segment, 
as opposed to SMP by SMP, which is better segment by segment, it's gonna have to be analyzed as it's paternal versus maternal. But still, so a tool like this for, for our purposes would still unzip the jacket. There'd be more computations to do afterwards, but at least you can do that. You can, it's there, at least it'd be worth it to map the ancestors on these phase kits, even if they aren't necessarily split up properly between male and female, I, maternal and paternal, because we could do a lot with that still using the tools on the site. Then we don't have an ethnicity tool. So maybe this is more pointing out a, a flaw on our site because everybody else seems to have one, but I, we don't really have enough data and we haven't gone out and done uh, research on reference populations and stuff, but I'm not sure I want to do it that way. Honestly, I like the genetic network stuff. What would you call it? The genetic communities on ancestry and they call it something else on 23 and me. I, I really like that kind of ethnicity better and it's going to play better into what I want to have next. And this is going to be a reality, but we're talking like five years from now, not tomorrow. And that's sort of the segment lab in the metaverse. And I don't know if the metaverse is ever going to really exist. I've, uh, you know, I've been to a couple concert venues in the metaverse in my personal life, but is, is it, you know, are we ever going to put genealogy in the metaverse? Maybe, maybe it'll make it more, uh, you know, attractive to the younger generation if we're doing cool stuff like that. But here's my vision for that. It's like walking down a supermarket, the chromosome browser now. Instead of just looking at a flat thing, it's like playing some third person game where you're walking down the aisles in a supermarket between the two copies of your chromosomes. And each segment is gonna be like a museum. That's how I wanna have it. And you'll be able to tell the ethnicity of a segment because you'll be able to look at things like how that segment has gone through time and where it's been, who else has had that segment and what part of the world. By looking at the, there'll be different, you'll be able to like turn the pages in the museum on the different ancestor profiles of other users that have this shared segment with you and learn about them. And I, I even like to incorporate, I know that, I don't remember the name of the company, but I saw them at Rootstack. They were doing this thing where they were mapping all of the locations of like historical markers around the world by, by place and by time. So that when you go down your aisle, you, uh, this part of your uh, chromosome browser supermarket, if you want to call it that, you're at a certain segment, you're at a certain shelf and, and it'll show you historical markers that are related to what, where this segment was at a certain time, what this sort of what the segment's been through in history, uh, outside of just the genealogical, but also in terms of history, what the segment is, has experienced, where it's been in the world, who it's passed through, where it's traveled. And I, I really want to see that happen. I'm nowhere near that, but I do have a vision of doing that in the, in the, in the distant future, because I think that would be the coolest, I don't know if you call it ethnicity, but like supermarket museum, DNA genetics tool ever. <laughs> we'll see. The big picture. Usually, I guess when I give a talk about Borland genetics, I kind of cover this stuff first, like why, why bother? But and I think we've covered a little bit in there, but we didn't really start off with what is Borland genetics or what's the purpose of this or what is my site for or what's the goal? We kind of backed into it from a discussion about genetics and about DNA reconstruction today. So the big picture here, why do we reconstruct our ancestors? And part of it is utility. Part of it is because when you reconstruct an ancestor using the descendants, you're not getting any new information. I mean, you may get a little bit if, if, if a certain segment happened to have been splintered that you put together or something like that. Therefore, it wasn't generating matches in the match algorithm. But for the most part, you're not getting new matches. You're getting the same old matches, but you are also creating a filter. So if I've got eight siblings or something like that, I don't need to look at each of those eight siblings matches. Instead, I just look at the four grandparent kits that I created for them. And I never need to go back at looking at those siblings matches if I've done my job in phasing them properly. As a practical matter, it's a, it's a nice way of filtering your matches, at least on the Borland genetics site, which I expect to grow very quickly in terms of the size and number of kits, especially thanks to doing talks like this and, and being invited to come here. And we've got a lot more dates on what I call the, the 2022 Creeper Tour coming up where I'll be promoting and trying to get people to upload, of course. But also there's some intrinsic value. And I think that's that's just like taking a picture, although, like I said, not as sentimental, but there is some value of you're preserving genetic data about your ancestor. I mean, it's not the type of thing where someday we're gonna clone them or something like that. We're never gonna get them back. But we'll know things about them from this data. You know, the, the, it's not just numbers. It actually shows what the bases were at certain positions and they mean things. They mean uh, they exhibit themselves in different traits. I mean, it's, it's, that's an emerging science, of course, but that, that information can be useful. And even if it's not useful, it's just nice to know. It's, you've preserved a part of, of your family history 
that's not otherwise preserved in, in stories or pictures. It's something different, but it's a part of the picture in my opinion. And we don't want, just wanna be a mathematical site though. And we want, to, we want users to be able to share their stories of their ancestors. So we're going for not just charts. That's why I want to make sure there were pictures of all the matches on the, when you go look at your matches and things like that. I want it to be much more, I, I don't wanna say like, but if like Jed Match and, and Find a Grave had a baby, it might look like what my vision for, you know, the, the match screen for, for Borland Genetics would be because it, it would have all the matches based on DNA. But when you click on them, it should tell the story of the ancestor like it does on, uh, on say, a find a grave profile or, or a, a family, a wiki uh, profile or something like that. That's the purpose here, because this is a genetic genealogy website. We're not also trying to do some other things. We're not, we're not doing the law enforcement thing. We, we don't accept law enforcement kits for upload. We're not really trying to do the adoption thing either, not that, that, not that there's anything against either of those two initiatives, but there are already sites to do that. And we're focusing on what, what we do best and what motiv motivated me for creating the tools. This is a site really for reconstructing your known ancestors. It's, I mean, maybe in the future it could be used for finding your unknown uh, adopted parent or something like that. But that's, that's not what I created the site for. I'm happy if you're able to do that, but I wanted to do this to create, to preserve ancestor genetic stories. So approximately half the kits on the site are crowdsourced ancestor kits, which means when you go to your match list, they will be public. You will probably see their picture and there's no point in contacting them because they are not going to answer back. Instead, you just look them up in the census. So that's kind of neat. And it's very, it's another thing that distinguishes us from the other databases. It's kind of the opposite paradigm of GEDmatch in that sense. And that, you know, GEDmatch only shows you, doesn't show you the research kits of other individuals. It doesn't, it only shows you the living kits. And ours is just the opposite. We'll show you that you match these living kits, but they'll all say private donor administered by Kevin Borland. And if you don't want to say that, just change your alias. You know, you could call yourself whatever you want on the site that's in the user settings. For the deceased people, you're going to see them on your match list. And I think that's tons more useful than seeing what living people you match because you don't have to do the work of looking so far back their trees if you already have it back to their great grandparent level and you know which great grandparent, for example, they might've matched you on. It's easier to find why you're related or come up with a theory on what part of the world you're related through, who in your tree this relation is, especially if you're doing your own reconstructions and you can walk it back on your end too. 